Good morning, and I call the Common Borough and Economic State Committee of the whole meeting to order. Welcome, everybody. And I would like to recognize that this meeting has been held on the traditional territory of the Leo Nation. I retain a motion to approve the agenda. Thank you. Welcome, John French. Squamish. Moved by Director French, seconded by Director Booker. Any opposition? Seeing none. The agenda is approved. We don't have a closed meeting, but we do have a delegation to welcome Garrett Bradley, Senior Sergeant, CSI RCMP, for a review and view into 2024. Welcome, Garrett. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody, for having me. Uh, Staff Sergeant Gareth Bradley. Been in the uh, Sea to Sky for 11 years now. Uh, and uh, yeah, I appreciate uh, your time for today. Thank you. Um, yeah, we'll go through this. I now have 10 minutes, so we'll uh, make it high <laughs> level you. for you. <laughs> it's been made clear. Uh, yeah, next slide, please. So it's just uh, Sea Sky RCP, as you may or may not know. Um, we uh, cover uh, a large area, uh, which includes Bowen Island, Squamish, and Whistler. We're a hybrid integrated uh, detachment model. Next slide. Not too many changes over the last few years. I uh, would like to note that uh, Corporal Jim uh, Gilmore is up in the Pemberton area now from Whistler. Um, it's been seconded for some time, and we have a new promotion on, on Bowen Island, uh, uh, Robert Notari. Uh, next slide. And then uh, we'll just get right into the stats for the uh, electoral areas. Uh, next slide, please. So the Squamish uh, RCMP Rural, which uh, includes uh, electoral area D, uh, includes Free Creek, Britannia Beach, Ring Creek, and Squamish Valley. Um, so this is a overview of our uh, stats um, that our crime analyst and EDIV did uh, over the last uh, couple months. Uh, everything seems to be trending on the downward uh, side, uh, very uh, typical uh, of the area. Our um, persons offenses and violent crime um, has uh, had a little bit of an uptick. Um, I was trying to dig into some of the um, uh, harassment uh, pieces there. As you can see, it's a 1,200% point from 1 to 13. Not a huge number, but uh, still uh, this, these uh, types of offenses include neighbor disputes or landlord tenancy issues. Uh, if what we see up in the valley uh, for a bit. Um, our property crime has been on the, on the decline uh, of note uh, across the sea to sky. Uh, our frauds uh, have uh, seen a significant increase. These are fairly sophisticated uh, text scams, email scams, or, or even phone call um, uh, uh, scams of uh, all different types of natures. They're very difficult to investigate, uh, mostly because uh, uh, the uh, offenders are uh, overseas. So it becomes a super complex investigation that doesn't generally lead into charges. So focusing on that, seeing these trends, we're going to, uh, for the 2024 um, year, we're going to look at uh, education uh, for folks uh, across the region. So we'll focus on that. Uh, and then just on the slide in uh, area D for mental health, uh, seen a significant decrease over last uh, last year, which is uh, um, a, a good stat to highlight. Next slide, please. Our traffic offenses, uh, very topical. Um, we've seen an increased number of uh, road and highway closures from last year. Uh, obviously, we continue work with uh, uh, Modi and Miller Cap uh, at a fairly high level, um, and we do what we can to uh, divert traffic in an inefficient way. Uh, it's very area dependent uh, on how big the crime scene is. Uh, when we do have a, a major collision, um, but we do everything we can to uh, get that highway open as fast as we can because we understand people need to get home and uh, get to where they're going. So, um, and then just our yeah overall persons crimes as I mentioned, it's very consistent uh, um, uh, increase over the last uh, year for the entire region. Right, next slide, please. This is a. Uh, uh, we deem it as Whistler Rural. Um, it's a portion of electoral area C. Uh, it bridges from uh, um, Wedgwood down to uh, border of Pemberton. So it's a bit of 
uh, more rural area uh, for these stats. Uh, you can see they're fairly low numbers across the range. So um, I would point out uh, it's missing persons is a fairly large category in this because it's all backcountry. Um, so we had, saw a significant decrease uh, in our um, uh, missing persons reports. Uh, probably going to attribute that to the, the milder weather that we've had uh, over the last, uh, uh, well, the entire winter. <laughs> uh, it was favorable weather conditions, so lots of our decreased uh, SAR calls are um, declining. So, um, yeah, that's that area. We'll talk about the next slide um, from the traffic perspective. In the same area, uh, it was all uh, trending in a downward uh, a, a downward. Uh, trend for that area. Uh, it's a very small segment of the highway. So uh, I would like to talk about the, the next slide and we'll talk about electoral, uh, the ma majority of electoral area C. Um, sorry, next slide. So this is what we call Pemberton Rural. Um, very typical or again, our, our violent crime assaults, um, our sex assaults are seen on increase um, we're seeing that across the region, but we've been working really hard with our partnership agencies to build capacity, uh, to build our trauma-informed response, work with our community partners, see to Sky Community Services, to develop that outreach, um, and uh, increased reporting is always uh, welcome uh, in these areas because we know it's highly under-reported. Under um, and then you can see our property crime in the section in Pemberton uh, is all on the, the decline. Um, as well um, in, as our uh, missing persons uh, reports in this area as well. Next slide, please. Uh, collisions, kind of seeing a little bit of an uptick uh, on our road race safety. Uh, it's important uh, for Pemberton members to be out there, uh, obviously doing road, road safety and road uh, enforcement. Um, and we're looking at, uh, always looking at different ways to implement um strategies to to present that throughout throughout the region um with enforcement uh activities uh and obviously community collaboration for certain things that are going on in the, in the areas um yeah next slide so this is our uh overall strategic plan uh so each uh one of the uh uh, areas had a uh, town hall, and from that town hall, these these infographics were created um, uh, with uh, community input. So these are all comments uh, from the community that were people who were attended online and in person. Uh, we were able to create kind of like uh, an updated mission, uh, vision, and, and values for our Sea to Sky uh, policing. Next slide. I'll just skip through to the next slide. So some uh, enforcement pillars that we did last year, um, we both in our north, uh, we call it north zone and south zone, so Squamish, Bowen and Pemberton and Whistler, um, we were able to uh, effectively staff some of our community response uh, teams, which is our special specialty community units, uh, made up of a corporal and a couple of constables. Uh, in, in that we've uh, realigned uh, to uh, put some processes in place in Squamish and we're working towards uh, building capacity in Whistler and Pemberton for uh, the uh, mobile incident crisis response uh, cars. So that's where an investigator will be paired up with a community social worker or a community nurse and they'll be able to go out into the communities to do proactive uh, follow up uh, for people that are in crisis. So uh, we're super excited about that program uh, being implemented across the Sea to Sky. Uh, and again, obviously our um, main focus uh, in Squamish Valley and up in uh, the electoral area C is uh, uh, enforcement with our partner agencies on uh, high volume weekends, uh, long weekends, and just doing back, uh, back country enforcement. Uh, generally concerning wildfires, wildfire events, um, uh, firearm shooting, that, that sort of thing. So uh, I know there's some changes in the regulations up in the Squamish Valley for no shooting zones uh, last year, um, which is a finable, about, a finable amount. So uh, for uh, the entire Ilaho area. Um, 
And then uh, our URSU and BC Highway Patrols, URSU being our integrated road safety units, or provincial uh, unit that specifically comes up to the highway to do uh, traffic enforcement. Um, and our education and uh, uh, training, uh, we have an influx of new members over the last uh, year, uh, coming from all different parts of the province into, and from Alberta. Uh, that includes Pemberton, Whistler, and Squamish. Uh, so that onboarding of uh, area knowledge and getting everybody up to speed on uh, local area processes is super important for us uh, moving forward. So we're excited to have uh, a lot more people in the area uh, to work. Next slide, please. Our uh, crew units focused on school and our Pemberton uh, detachment uh, focused on uh, school and youth engagement in the community. And we're looking to do some open houses uh, for all the detachments in the 2024 area. Or, sorry, 2024 year. Uh, next two slides, please. Thank you. Uh, last year, Whistler saw um, a couple of members uh, receive uh, uh, Lex Awards. This is an uh, award given out by the province um, where uh, a member has uh, achieved, a 25, achieved 25 um, impaired driving charges uh, just personally and themselves. Uh, so <laughs> not <laughs> wow, that came out wrong. <laughs> Should have rehearsed that one. I'm sorry. <laughs> I want to go check. They have, yeah. <laughs> they have charged, charged uh, 25 more people with uh, impaired driving offenses. So uh, it's, a, it's a significant award uh, if you can reach that milestone. So it's super proud that uh, two were all stars. Uh, and we really focused on last year on our impaired driving numbers. Uh, and it, it, it I think, yeah, I think five uh, in, and three in Squamish met that threshold in 2023. So it's on the increase, uh, which is good. It means we're out doing proactive work uh, and keeping the roads safe. Uh, multiple members were also recognized uh, commanding officers awards uh, for various uh, life-saving um, uh, files where they're put into uh, harm's way to save somebody uh, or, uh, you know, uh, stopped a high-risk uh, um, vehicle and, uh, took down an offender. So, uh, yeah, it's good to recognize uh, the folks doing the good work. So, um, and it's just building our workplace culture. We're, I, it's a passion for me to build mental health, wellness, and resiliency in our, uh, in our teams. It's going to be more effective for them in the long term uh, and help getting uh, folks on track uh, and team building exercises within our detachment. Uh, this year, Sasha uh, Banks in Whistler has worked really hard to bring the Women's Leadership Insti Institute uh, to um, Whistler. They're holding a, a conference uh, where law enforcement, uh, women in law enforcement come and uh, talk uh, about uh, various issues. And that's happening in the next uh, few months. So super uh, proud of that uh, and the work she's done on that. Next slide, please. Uh, these are just all the infographics uh, for the different uh, towns uh, that we visited. Uh, and uh, yeah, so Pemberton's in there, uh, Bowen and Squamish and Whistler. Next slide. And uh, yeah, so we're looking to um, obviously continue our work uh, with everybody being coming in and being new, uh, uh, continuity uh, and building capacity in our emergency management planning is uh, very important for me. It's uh, one of our top priorities, uh, just given the, the uh, unpredictability of our uh, climate situations and emergency management uh, pieces that we've had. Um, we just completed a major tabletop exercise um, with the entire region a couple of weeks ago, which was fantastic. Uh, I was, uh, yeah, I was, I was standed by the work that was happening in the, in the room uh, by everybody, because uh, that's not their normal day job. So everybody stepped up and it was, uh, it was really well, well attended and everybody put a hundred percent in. So I was uh, super uh, encouraged to see that. Uh, and then uh, working with the SLRD uh, emergency management uh, team, uh, we did the air action report for the atmospheric river that happened. Uh, event that happened a couple months ago. Uh, also engagement uh, with Lillooet and Squamish Nations uh, for relationship building is uh, important to us as well. Uh, also meeting with the, the new CAO uh, in, in a couple weeks, uh, Carrie. So, uh, and then topical is the engagement with Ferdy Creek and Britannia Bay, uh, Beach uh, expansion of their communities and um, figuring out what that looks like long-term. And then uh, continued work with our uh, BC Parks, NROs, and uh, Conservation Office 
uh, engagement in our backcountry policing. Uh, as you can see, there's a lot of photos of me in this uh, presentation. <laughs> Apparently, I like to be out in the mountains, uh, out in lakes, and uh, yeah, I, it's it, this area and uh, you know having the uh, stewardship uh, to do the protection pieces is uh, super important for me. Uh, emergency management is important for me, so uh, being uh, connected with those communities is uh, also uh, you know one of my top priorities. Um, we're looking at developing a backcountry policing model um, within the Sea to Sky. Um, it's kind of like a longer term strategy. And then obviously uh, the highlights are these uh, micro, micro car positions where these nurses and um, um, uh, clinicians and members can go out uh, into the communities and uh, help uh, people proactively. So thank you. Thank you. Oh, Thank you, Staff Sergeant Bradley. <laughs> and Director Mack, please go ahead. Yep. Do you still have your boat patrols on Anderson? Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> as you're able to. Yeah, as we're able to. Yeah. So uh, we only have one uh, small rib boat, uh, but we have to share it between the four detachments. So yes, in essence, we do have that uh, capability for sure. Uh, and that is part of the plan moving forward. Uh, but we also have to take the boat down to Bowen. Uh, Swamish uh, houses the boat uh, because it's kind of central. Um, but uh, yeah, those- So you boats. have your own boat now? We do, yes. Okay, the fun point, I you know uh, you're looking to get one. So that's good because I know uh, just from feedback I get, um, you're very well, uh, we, you know, accept it on the lake. It's, it's it's really good to have you there, yeah, especially on, you know, on the busy weekends. Well, every weekend, but yeah, with turnover, so it's uh, those co courses are only offered certain times of the year, mm -hmm. um, and they're very hard to get. So it's just, it, and again, we have to build up our capacity to have uh, specifically boat trained members to to go out and do that to be yeah. safe. So um, yeah, well, that's one of our areas of growth. And uh, we'll be looking at that. So we used to have um, uh, one member that transferred to our Marine, uh, our RCMP Marine section uh, from uh, Whistler. And uh, he was very much in charge of that area. Yeah. So uh, it's a big hole to fill, but uh, that's part of our planning. So right looking on, at thank it. you. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Director Pennygill and then Director Richmond. Yeah, thanks. We had a bit of. <laughs> okay. Bit of a preview of the presentation in Squamish, and uh, one of the things you didn't mention today, but I know you're working on at least in Squamish, is uh, response to people that are neurodivergent. And uh, so, I want to give you an opportunity if you want to touch on that a bit. But a little bit related to that is, you know, the the microcar stuff uh, in Squamish at least seem to be, um, you know, some of the more Squamish focused organizations are partners in that. Uh, how does it work across the region when you get into area districts? Who, who are your contacts and who's the sort of community support on that? Is it VCH mostly or, or how does that happen? Yeah, so we're working uh, in partnership with uh, Vancouver Coastal Health um, to develop, develop, develop those models um, and expand that out. So uh, there's no... Um, uh, current funding for that is like we have an investigator in Whistler, but the, uh, we're working towards building that capacity in, in Whistler um, from the BCH side. Uh, and I think there's a pilot project um, moving forward and uh, that will hopefully uh, build into uh, Pemberton as well. But yeah, it does get a little bit tr tricky with boundaries and, and things like that. So. Thanks. Um, I'm really um, interested to hear as it comes out more about the backcountry policing plan. I think across our region, we should, we uh, we face issues with folks in our in our backcountry coming to enjoy the area, which which we invite them to do. But um, there's it's as you know, it's hard to manage, and and we've collectively been sort of crying for more boots on the ground over the years to just to manage everything from human waste. Uh, wildlife conflict and and I would say top of mind being wildfire um, and so as you put that plan together if there's anything local government can do to help inform some of that because we know our areas in terms of what's what's hard hit but maybe even more importantly if I, I'd be curious to know what kind of inter-ministry support you're going to get for that you know uh, when, when folks are going down FSRs or, or they're in Provincial parks, are you getting the resources the RCMP need from other ministries, from FNR, Flinroar, or, or whoever, not to support those activities? Because we would really like to see a little bit more 
um, management of the backcountry again, especially with wildfire season around the corner. So, if there's anything as you're building that plan that yeah. we can help with local government or reform, please make the call. Yeah, there will definitely be a, a consultative process for that uh, and in seeking input. Uh, what that looks like, obviously, you guys all know your areas uh, really well. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll build that in, obviously. But uh, we do have a, a small uh, provincial budget to do some backcountry policing initiatives. Um, you know, could it be more? Absolutely. Uh, you know, and we build that capacity in uh, to make sure our members are uh, applying the laws and what to look out for and, and things like that. But uh, definitely, we can. Uh, you know, funding is. Uh, you know, we have a certain amount of funding, so we have to operate within that budget. Well, if you, again, if you need support for advocacy for funding for that sort of activity, I think you might find that. All right. Thank you. Thank you. And I have Director Harpo, Director Demare, and then Director Morgan. <laughs> and then I think we should probably stop it there. Okay, go ahead, Lori. Thank you for your report. Um, so, yeah. Uh, just capture on what Director Richman said, any takeaways that um, happen that we can do for the backcountry, you know, over in our area too, would be would be helpful. So if they come not only to the um, to the municipalities, but to uh, the region, that would be great. Uh, but I wanted to ask you, you said something about uh, you were going to do training when you were talking about like, and I'm going to talk about particularly telephone scams and uh, with seniors so often I will a couple of times a year anyways I try and put it on my Facebook page or whatever mm -hmm. about TELUS's call control mm -hmm. because I find that seniors in particular like somebody to talk to they're lonely so when those phone calls come through and they come through at, at an alarming rate sometimes and and I think once you pick up, there's nobody there. But once you pick up and then they hang up, then they know that somebody is picking up. But call control makes you actually push that number that says, you know, this this number has call control, press yeah. six or whatever. And that has alleviated a lot of those calls. So I hope that, you know, when you're in your, your training, that is something that, and again, with seniors is, is a big one, but I mean, they drive me crazy. So I put it on and yeah. it works like a charm and it's super easy to do through television. Yeah, the, the frauds are complex or multifaceted, uh, get very complicated mm -hmm. uh, when you're dealing with banks and, um, you know, you see every, we have to work with our business partners as well, right? A lot of folks will might go in and buy iTunes cards. Uh, and then yes. give the pins over. That's another way where yes. people come to the front door and say like, hey, um, you know, or they have a bit of information about somebody and, um, you know, somebody's in trouble and they need help or, or whatnot. So sure. um, or a fake piece of jewelry is like, you know, they're representing it as this. And mm -hmm. uh, it, it, there's a, a variety of different things that we need to cover. So, And I know so, that yeah. like uh, one of the emails went out with my name on it and somebody actually bought a, a an Amazon $500 card. Yeah. And, you know, and then contacted me, but, or, yeah, and then, but then it was too late, you know, I felt terrible about that, but so that, that kind of prompted me to start, you know, advocating for that. And, and like I said, tell us call control is just one piece of it, but it's a really important piece. So yeah, absolutely. So we would yeah. have to build our uh, strategy around that about education and doing sure. that. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Director DeMere. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for the presentation. I've got just one question on Squamish Valley, you mentioned no shooting zone and being able to find people. Is that through the provincial government? Uh, yes, uh, yeah, the NRO's uh, Natural Resource Office has uh, worked really hard to get that new shooting area. Um, and uh, forgive me, I can't remember what this, uh, this section, but uh, yeah, that snow shooting zone uh, starts from the gravel and goes all the way up to the ELO. It was only a small uh, segment. Um, but it, it's can carried all the way up now. So yeah, I'm just curious if, if people have uh, tags for hunting, are they able to hunt in there? Yes. So the, it's recreational shooting. There's a, a difference. So you can still hunt, hunt in that peak. And it's uh, again, for 400 meters uh, off uh, the roadway. Yeah. Where we've got very similar up in uh, area A up in the uh, Bridge River Valley, but there's no finding. Right. And it's SLRD. Yeah. Uh, no shooting zones. Yes. Yeah. Around I mean, communities. Definitely yeah. have more well can have an offline conversation about that. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah.
Thank you, Director Morden. Thank you, Chair. Thanks for the report. Um, we heard from Sasha Banks, I think, last week at, the, at our committee hall, and um, with decriminalization um, having been, uh, it's been over just over a year now. Um, what has that looked like in this Sea to Sky? I know what it's been like in Whistler, but what has that looked like? Yeah, overall, um, like I think you can see the numbers. It's, it's, we're not seizing drugs. We're not uh, doing anything like that. Uh, we're more advocates to help people and hand out the resource cards uh, when we do. Um, and uh, yeah, it's like we weren't really doing it before. Um, there's not a lot of uh, folks that come in to our contact that were, you know, randomly seizing drugs or anything like that. Uh, obviously, uh, yeah, every area has got a different uh, um, concern for sure. Um, Are you seeing more public use or? Um, no, no, no. Yeah. Thank you. One more question, Director Dijon. Did you want to ask something? I saw you. Hi. Hand. Yeah, I was just on. I live in um, Squamish Valley, and it was just on the no shooting zone. I was just curious if there was public education or outreach for the community uh, to be aware of that, because I know that there is still a, a shooting range off of one of the Forest Service roads, and we were out a couple months ago and people were still shooting. So I actually wasn't personally aware of that. So I just didn't know how that was getting put out to the local community. Yeah, I think there was a, a bit of a campaign online, uh, but obviously that's a select if you're not seeking that or learning that, but uh, yeah. Um, and uh, I haven't been up in a while. Uh, I can't remember if the sign signage is up there yet. But, yeah, um, it might be something to post on our, our local residence page too, just to help get yeah, the awareness absolutely. out. Yeah. yeah. I know it was a huge concern because there's multiple different sites up there. Well, thank you. Um, Staff Sergeant Bradley with that, I'll uh, uh, just thank you for your presentation. Great. Um, and we're going to have uh, also thank you now. Now, I need to ask uh, the board to uh, indulge in a change of the approval of the agenda and move uh, the presentation by Jeanette Nadon up now on Indigenous relations. She has some other commitments, and so we're going to hear from her now. Okay. So she sets it up and she says all that. And this sounds sketchy. She's like, well, my husband's gone on the baseball. Yes. I know. Mexico, which is what she's like, she's like, he said, he wouldn't fucking tell me. I can't buy the bike off. I'm like, look at it, I'm out. I had one of those really guys. I was like, should we come back to the order and invite Jeanette to be here? She is. Good morning, Miss Nidon. Welcome. Good morning, everyone. 5.3 uh, on the agenda. <laughs> yes. Uh, th thanks, everyone. Jeanette Naden, uh, Indigenous Relations Advisor with the SLRD. Um, I'm here to present an update on the SLRD's Indigenous Relations Truth and Reconciliation Function. Um, specifically with respect to the planned use of the funding that was recommended as part of the SLRD's 2024 financial plan for Indigenous relations, truth and reconciliation. Um, so uh, I'll just briefly go through the report that was uh, included on the agenda. Um, back in September, when I presented the direction request report, the board had directed staff to explore options to apply the unallocated funds from our relationship building reserve uh, in truth, uh, in the truth and reconciliation to start building a foundation and empathy prior to our 2024 actions to move forward into reconciliation. Um, and with that also that we uh, scope costs for training and increasing staff capacity for Indigenous relations. So since that time, we've been working towards that. Um, we, I also included an, um, sorry, the, the, the board made a resolution about the Nuquan Twal gathering as well at that meeting. And so I'll be touching on that as well this morning. 
Um, but back in September, uh, with that direction request report, um, the board had um, determined that there were four main priorities uh, with respect to Indigenous relations and reconciliation. The first was to recognize the long-term uh, complex nature of the work and to begin by uh, setting a strong foundation um, uh, through the development of a strategic Indigenous relations, truth and reconciliation framework. Uh, also that continued relationship building was a priority um, that we needed to increase our organizational capacity by embedding cultural awareness and sensitivity training. And also that we needed to continue learning about Indigenous rights, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission calls to action, and, uh, and the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. So the, the, what staff has uh, proposed that we would do is uh, hire a consultant that will help us develop an Indigenous Relations Truth and Reconciliation Framework for the organization. Um, and the process to develop that um, framework is we're planning to begin with setting a very strong foundation by incorporating quite a bit of training in advance of a strategic planning workshop. Um, and then following the strategic planning workshop, we would take that information and the consultant would work with us to develop the framework. Um, so we, we got three proposals to do the work and all of them came back uh, with around a, a very similar budget of about 40 to $45,000 to do the work, which would include the training component. Um, so the, the approach is that they would review the existing materials and commitments and best practices, conduct interviews with senior staff, board members, and key First Nations contacts. Uh, to more fully assess the situation, identify potential issues, def uh, define our aspirations and confirm our training needs, and then provide training for the board and staff on a range of topics, including Indigenous worldview, cultural safety, hidden bias, um, to build a strong foundation for the workshop, and then conducting a strategic planning workshop to assess our organizational readiness, define our vision for reconciliation, uh, articulate core values and principles and confirm our strategic themes and goals and then identify those key foundational actions that we need to do to move forward to advance the work. And then uh, creating a preliminary framework which would be then sent out for feedback and then finalizing the framework. Um, so that's basically the framework in a nutshell, and I'll I'll uh, I'll take questions on that in a moment. I just wanted to touch on the other things that we've been up to, um, with respect to the continued relationship building. We are working towards uh, holding a Nukwantwa regional gathering with the Liwat Nation and the Village of Pemberton that's scheduled for uh, May the twenty fourth. So I hope everybody has that in their calendars. I've received our RSVPs from almost everybody now, I think. So thank you very much. Um, we're looking, originally we were we wanted to focus that on the United Nations Declaration and talk about what the village and the SLRD were up to in terms of reconciliation and hear from Liwat Nation about um, sort of what their expectations were. And we're still planning to do that, but we're looking at doing it in a way that will incorporate more storytelling. Um, we're gonna be holding the gathering up at the site of the Coast Mountain Outdoor School. So that's about 25 minutes, uh, sorry, 25 kilometers north of Pemberton. And that particular uh, venue was uh, basically, it was owned by the school district and uh, given back to Liwat Nation in 2022. Uh, so it's an excellent example of land back. Um, we've also uh, learned from Liwat Nation that it was the site of a former Liwat village. Um, and so there's a lot of opportunity for us to sort of weave stories of, of Liwat culture and the, the truth of what happened and the land back story while talking about uh, Indigenous self-determination and the United Nations Declaration and hopefully just creating a really experiential learning opportunity and lots of opportunity for dialogue uh, for the people who are there. 
So that's sort of what we're uh, the concept that we're that we're working on. The the New Quintoil Intergovernmental Relations Committee meeting met last February and sort of came up with that concept. So now staff is working towards uh, executing that. Um, and in the north, uh, District of Lillooet and the Lillooet Tribal Council and the SLRD staff have met a couple of times to confirm that we do still want to have leadership gatherings, at least one in 2024. Um, my we were supposed to have a meeting this afternoon, but unfortunately I had to cancel it due to a personal commitment. Uh, but we'll be rescheduling that for later uh, later this month. Um, but the intent certainly is that we will hold at least one leadership gathering. And I did hear from uh, Jim MacArthur at the Tribal Council, and uh, they've been given an extension on their grant. So we have until December to hold that meeting, which is great. Um, the third priority was organizational change through education and training. And so staff has recommended a budget of $25,000 for this in 2024. And um, we're proposing that we use that funding to do the training that's going to help inform the development of our of our reconciliation framework. So we'd be working with a consultant to do uh, two half day online trainings and then one full day training uh, for staff and the board um, on a variety of topics. Um, including uh, cultivating safe spaces, uh, the United Nations Declaration, Indigenous worldview, cultural intelligence and cultural safety protocols, uh, hidden bias, and uh, engagement strategy best practices. Um, and I think in terms of the acting on the, the UN Declaration, um, I, I've shared a couple of resources in there for the board. I also wanted to just highlight that um, the local uh, Lower Mainland Local Government Association through their AGM uh, next month, I believe they're planning to hold a Indigenous led panel discussion on the UN declaration. So um, hopefully people have RSVP'd and will be attending that because I think that will be a really good learning opportunity to hear straight from First Nations and Indigenous people about the UN declaration and why why it's important and um, having that discussion. Um, and I think that's, uh, that's sort of it in a nutshell. And I guess I just wanted to say thank you very much and I will open it up for questions. Thank you to Metanagan. And I'm looking around the table to see if board members would like to. Yes. Director Pettingale. Yeah, the first one, just a confirmation, because uh, we heard about some of the things that the board has been asked to support funding-wise. Just want to make sure that made it into what we approved yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And then just yes. a, a personal request a little bit, because this all sounds fantastic. Um, the, the challenge is managing personal schedules and commitments. And so the more we can include on committed the whole days or... Mm -hmm. uh, makes it a little bit easier, but hope to find a way no matter when it's uh, scheduled, but that would help a lot for me personally. Yes, thank you. Uh, Director Hoffel. So thank you for that presentation. Uh, I think that that's a good framework and it will give us a clear vision on what our role is regionally um, and having that First Nation input, well, I think will really aid us in developing that that framework for our organization. Um, my question is actually for the online training. Uh, is that is that will that be a scheduled um, day time or is that something that we can access when we can access it? Is there an option? It will be a, this particular training will be scheduled because we'll be hiring the consultant and delivering it live. Um, so this particular training will be scheduled and we'll be lo looking to try and coordinate that so that it fits the most, you know, so that it's works for the most people, I guess I would say. Thank you. I'm not seeing any other hands. 
move to receive the um, information the report. The mayor is moving to receive the report. Sure. Thank you very much, Jeanette, and seconded by Director Burford. Any other reports? Seeing none, report is received. Thank you, Jeanette. Yes, wishes on your travels today. Thank you very much. It's nice to see everybody. Thank you. So we take a five minute recess and then we'll move to the next. Uh, we'll go to staff reports and then there's an incident started. So would you like to move it up first? Will you? Yeah, it'll be very quick. Okay. We'll hear from the CAO quickly and then a five minute break. I just need a coffee. Uh, good morning, everyone. I, I, I have nothing to report. Oh. Oh. <laughs> okay. Order to 10. Four, four minute break now. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we will have strategic plan and next steps. Please be straight. Welcome to the Good morning, um, Patricia Lester, Home Director of Communications and Engagement for the Squamish Lower Wet Regional District. And I'm here today to provide the board with a summary of the strategic planning process um, and to request a decision on approval of the draft strategic plan with a new purpose statement and slightly revised uh, vision and mission statements, as well as a plan on a page, which you will see shortly. Um, next slide, please, that. Um, so just wanted to recap um, a little bit about um, where we've been in this process. Um, this isn't the first time that you've um, had me here to talk about strategic planning. Um, this work started with the board back in December of 2022 um, with the board priority setting exercise um, at the uh, community center. Um, and then we continued with that work through 2023 with the development of our performance reporting documents. Um, and board strategic planning workshops. Uh, the last update that the board had on this work was in July when staff advised that a draft strategic plan would be developed and brought back to the board in September. Um, and then the rest of July unfolded as did our historic uh, emergency <laughs> operations center activation, um, the longest uh, ever EOC activation, I think in the history of the SLRD, uh, which continues with the recovery process to this day, which. Uh, several staff members are still very much engaged in, including myself. Um, so basically what that boils down to is that the work on the strap plan um, came to a bit of a screeching halt, sadly. Um, uh, we had uh, also, as you know, um, change in leadership at the CAO level, um, and the interim CAO and myself both were um, refocused our work um, to uh, focus on the EOC operations. Um, but... Um, all that being said, I'm um, very happy to be here today with the draft strategic plan um, and being able to pick up this work again um, and move forward. Um, so we're gonna talk a little bit more about that and just walk through that plan with you. Uh, next slide, please. So this is just, again, a little bit about what we're gonna do today, just the draft, share this draft plan, um, as well as a plan on the page, which you haven't seen, um, and uh, for your consideration, and talk a little bit about the process for moving forward um, with the notion that we would review again in the fall, just to make sure that the priorities um, still align for the board. Um, not that we would um, redo this process again, but just to revisit it. <laughs> uh, next slide, please. <laughs> Um, so this is the first page of the strategic plan. Next slide. Table of contents is really straightforward. Next slide, please. A uh, very brief overview of the regional district, um, how we came to be and what we are. Um, next slide, please, Yvette. Uh, photos of the board of directors. Next slide, please. A uh, message um, as approved from the board chair. Very straightforward as well. Next slide, please. Um, this is where I think uh, we should pause for a minute just to um, reflect on the work that um, the board did on this last year. Um, you will recall that we did some workshops, workshop sessions on reviewing our current vision, mission, and value statements. Um, those are the ones on the screen now. 
Um, and we, we had a lot of um, input from the board. We also took that to the staff level um, for input. Um, and when we went back and revisited all of those uh, notes and the comments and the feedback, um, really found that we weren't actually very too too far off from uh, where the board felt um, that the SLRD uh, should be in terms of its vision, mission, and values. So we have made some very slight modifications, um, which I will present now. Next slide, please, with that. Um, at the, really the direction of the former, <clears throat> excuse me, CAO, um, we did add a purpose statement um, to the, uh, these statements um, for the board to consider. Um, so we haven't had that in the past. We do talk on the website about the role of the regional district, um, but haven't just um, succinctly come up with a statement to summarize our purpose. So we've proposed that our purpose statement could be that we serve as trusted stewards of the region, fostering an environment where communities and residents thrive. Um, and then I'll just, if we, uh, we don't need to go back to the slide, but our current vision statement is that the Squamish Lillooet Regional District will lead regional governance in the province of BC through cooperation and cohesive participation by its members. And um, there was a lot of discussion around that. Um, when we look at the regional growth strategy as that sort of overarching document, it has its own um, vision statement in there as well. So we wanted to, we took that statement and kind of, and incorporated it into this existing vision statement um, and modified slightly. So the proposed new vision statement is that the Squamish Lillooet Regional District will lead regional governance by promoting collaboration and engagement among its members, partners, and all levels of government. Our vision for the region is one comprised of diverse, distinct, distinct and livable communities that share a commitment to practice economic, social, and environmental sustainability. And that second sen sentence was pulled from the RGS. Um, and then the mission statement, we didn't really change this much at all, um, basically just added um, another word. So the original mission statement said that the Squamish Lillooet Regional District's mission is to enhance the quality of life of constituents through the facilitation of regional and community services for the benefit of present and future generations. And we've just added the word um, delivery in there. So the new proposed statement is that the Squamish Lillooet Regional District's mission is to enhance the quality of life of constituents through the facilitation and delivery of regional and community services for the benefit of present and future generations. And then the value statements did not change. Um, and they remain to govern with courage, integrity, and respect in an open, honest, and responsible manner using both common sense and the best available information to respect social, environmental, and economic values, values and limitations while maintaining a high quality of life in all areas of our diverse region. Um, we can continue to walk through the rest of the um, strap plan. Um, so this slide um, really just talks about um, that hierarchy of plans and talks about the why, the what, the how, and the do. And so here we're just outlining that the why is aligning with that regional growth strategy, which is our 20 year horizon document, five year review cycle, and informs master plans and official community plans of the areas that um, are participating. Um, and then the what is this strategic plan, um, which aims to establish the overall direction and priority areas for the regional district for a four-year term and provides a high-level overview of what the board wishes to accomplish during the term of office. So this is where we get back into some of that um, process piece where ideally at the start of each new mandate, when a board is elected, we would do a fulsome review of the strategic plan. Um, and then the other plans that fall out uh, from that would just be updated as needed. And that comes, that's the how and the do. So the how is that corporate action plan. And then the do is our um, departmental and individual work plans. Um, next slide, please. Um, so this slide um, is really, these are the big ideas. So um, when we uh, did the strategic planning workshops, um, we, the board, uh, threw out a lot of ideas, things that we that you felt were priorities um, for the regional district. And you'll recall we had the poster sheets and we met in different rooms and um, did a lot of good work there. Um, when we went back and looked at all of that information, we were really able to identify some um, theme uh, areas, priority areas, uh, pillars, if you will, um, that really did a good job of um, encapsulating all of that um, work. So. When we look at this slide, we're really we're, we've been talking about this strap plan internally as a bit of a, a strap plan light. 
document because this is where we've captured the themes, but we haven't dialed into the goals and objectives under each of these. So that might be work that the board would like to do in the future um, through a more robust strategic planning uh, session. Um, but for now, this captures um, and enable to move forward, enables us to move forward with a strategic plan, capturing those um, themed areas um, that have been identified. So we've highlighted um, community well-being and livability. And under there, we've slotted affordable housing and regional transit for now. Um, emergency planning response and recovery with fire services review, fire smart program implementation, and EOC tabletop exercises and training. Truth, reconciliation, and relationships, uh, Indigenous relations, UNDRIP, community partnerships, government partnerships, sustainability, which includes economic sustainability, environmental sustainability, and cultural sustainability, responsible governance and service excellence, including performance management, governance excellence, service capacity alignment, and advocacy, and under there we have regional transit, regional health, and rural road service. Um, next slide, please. Uh, the last slide, la or sorry, the last page of the strat plan is the message from the chief administrative officer, which is also very straightforward. Next slide, please, Matt. So um, next steps is, um, you know, we have some work to do still on the process development in the request for decision report that was included in your agenda package. We touched a bit on um, the process of uh, entering into um, an agreement with the government, government frameworks works, government frameworks um, group for um, developing um, reports and um, improving our internal process um, work plan flow and that kind of work. That work was also delayed last year. So the aim um, is, and um, through the chair of the CAO um, may wish to speak to this as well, but um, the goal is to um, get back on track with that work uh, with implementation uh, potentially for later this year that will help us with um, those reporting pieces, uh, both in reporting to the board and reporting out to the public. Uh, we'll also help with our internal um, work plans and, and those types of documents potentially, and in future could also be used to actually help um, to develop the actual strategic plan document as well. Um, so there's still some work uh, in that space to move forward. Um, and then today we're looking to the board to um, move this strategic plan um, or not, uh, provide further direction, um, if you will. And then we also have, if we want to go to the next slide, please, Yvette, um, a plan on a page, which is um, just capturing again that purpose, vision, mission, and value statements, um, reminds us of this um, why, what, how, and do, and the strategic priority areas. And the idea with this document is that we would have this available, um, easily accessible as a, a one-page sort of reference guide um, to the board, uh, in the boardroom, and um, internally that we can use as a reference. Um, Next slide, please, Yvette. That's it for the presentation. Happy to answer any questions, take feedback. Come back again. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. And uh, I have to compliment the proposed uh, modification for the purpose, vision, and mission value statements. In particular, um, uh, partners in all level, levels of government. We've seen that in action, and um, it's really good to see, you know, our EOC team working with the provincial government on the residents' behalf, the constituents' behalf. So I think that fits perfect in this. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, go ahead, Director French. Um, thanks, Chair. And uh, out of the gate, apologies, I've not been a part of this process. So I'm looking at this brand new with fresh eyes and uh, my experience with strategic plans um, indicates that there are usually timelines attached and I don't, I don't see any time goals. I don't see any deadlines. There's nothing really about timing. So I wonder if you might touch a bit on um, what's with the lack of any timeline and is in the future there a conversation around time? Sure. Uh, so with regard to timelines, are you referring to timelines for specific work or for the strat plan evolution and delivery or? I, I think both. Okay. Um, so 
Heather, no, sorry, through the chair, the CAO may want to um, elaborate on this a bit. Um, this, again, um, we've been looking at this as, a, as I said, a, a strap plan light, um, because, you know, well, I also noted that we, we haven't dug into the um, goals and objectives either, which would sometimes be included in a, in a strategic plan. Um, I, sorry. Okay. Yeah. Yes, Sharon, a good question, and I, I have the same things in my mind. Um, this has been a really quick push. Um, just prior to being hitting my two months, really decided to get this on the on the table, realizing that it has been stalled since July, and seeing in the first two board meetings that a guiding document for decision making and the strategic versus the tactical was required. This will also help me review the current work plans that staff have and apply timelines that are realistic, that I, I really can't make promises not understanding capacity and current work. The next steps after this is to look at the fuel, hopefully in April, which is a list of all outstanding resolutions and have the board review it with the lens of this plan on the page. The idea being that one page is, is almost like a placemat in our board meetings, so we could, are, are we making decisions that are part of our vision, or are we starting something new? And that that's that's the plan. So it is really a strap strat plan light because I would normally want much more time on something like this. However, I feel the need to have something in front of us is more important than that detail. Thank you. Perfect sense, Director Pettigrew. Yeah. Yeah, a couple of things, and first, I just want to say. Uh, you know, I, I assume it must have been challenging to go into the year expecting to be doing some work and then not being able to focus on that. But I want to thank you the, for the very high pressure and critical EOC work. Um, it, it was so important. So thank you very much for uh, shifting that way. Um, a couple thoughts I had just reading this, comparing the current, and I, I really want to be careful not to get into wordsmithing and so on, but comparing the uh, current versus proposed vision. In the current one, that cooperation cohesive, to me really communicates what I believe is, you know, we are diverse and have differences, but through the RGS, and even though there's different OCPs with, you know, differences in them, I do feel like this group really does have a shared vision and we're, we're it feels like we're all pulling in the same way despite some of those differences. And in the, the newer vision, that's, missing for me a little bit it, it makes me feel like no we're a, sort of somewhat going in different directions maybe or quite possibly we come and we collaborate well together but we're not necessarily on the same path and I, I wonder you know if if we actually have a shared feeling of yes that is our um you know like to me that the point of the RGS is we're all pulling in the same direction I wonder if a clear articulation of that is important um, and other folks may have a different position in terms of, you know, we really need that independence to go in our different areas and municipalities. Um, the other thing, uh, and it's a smaller one, and it was sort of existing, so maybe we just don't fiddle with it. Common sense always, uh, it's a bit itchy for me because, you know, <laughs> common sense, are we talking about? And, you know, I get this sort of sentiment of, like, maybe certain things are... We think of it as self-evident and so on, but, you know, I'm a bit skeptical of that concept. Uh, so just a comment there. I don't know if anyone else is bothered that. And then the last one, I, you know, I'm fairly focused on the climate. It's come up in our discussions and it's just a question for me, even our strategic planning. At some times it, it seemed like it was really important to the group. And then other times it was sort of one of many things. And this sort of, as this plan, it's, it doesn't raise to the top of like, it's sort of in there and sustainability, but it's not clear. And so I'm actually not mm -hmm. sure myself as a board where we are on that. And um, so, yeah, it's maybe a question to the group. Thank you, uh, Director Bumping. It's interesting point about climate. I, I, there's a lot that's probably in the top five priorities that aren't listed as part of your mission or vision. You don't 
itemize rural road infrastructure, whatever the major priority is. And so I, I'm, 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 I personally remain committed. I think more in this area. But oh, not in mission, vision, yeah, yeah, yeah. strategies. Oh, I see. Um, yeah, yeah, the strategic priorities. That makes that would make sense to me. For clarity, um, it's because it's a bit of a side conversation, but I wasn't suggesting climate in the mission vision. It, it's in the strategic priorities. There's sustainability, but you know, climate isn't even mentioned there. And so that's I'm wondering if somewhere in that area, if as a board we think it rises to that level or not. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. I think it does. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, it's, it's interesting. Um, the uh, I'll just uh, we'll try to compartmentalize this to the, the climate, the climate question. And I think I see it in um, community well being and livability, I see it in sustainability. Um, you know, um, however, uh, I also see it in emergency planning, uh, mm -hmm. in so much as the effects mm -hmm. of climate change that we're feeling. So I do think that, um, I don't know if it's a repackaging of what's there and like finding a way to get that into a title. And I know that it's woven into all the work that we do, um, but um, I, I do think that it needs, it, we do well serve, but like being more specifically highlighted somewhere, whether it's an overarching piece that's not necessarily a priority area because it's so embedded in all those pieces or or like there's a few ways we can capture things like that that are foundational um and um i think that truth that when i think about those foundational pieces i think about uh truth and reconciliation and i think about climate and so many things flow from flow from there you know like those are just foundational to the pieces that we're doing and how we intend to do our work and in my opinion in my approach to this work and I'd like to see that reflect I think we can do a better job of reflecting that here because I do think that we're when we run up against the edge of those of those topics the boards are very supportive of, of initiatives in those broad you know for those broad reasons so um putting that here somewhere is I think is is um and I think the RGS does a good job of speaking to that too so there's likely uh somewhere to pull this from uh but I do think it, it deserves more than it, it, than I'm seeing on the on the page. And I, if we're trying to get to that place, the the plan on the page, the placemat piece, then it certainly needs to be on that piece somewhere. Mm -hmm. I agree, and I recall the workshop that we had a few years ago in the community center with climate change and indigenous relationships being like the two overarching, you know, the umbrella that everything else would be considered under. I was pretty comfortable with that, and. It seemed to have a bit more of a, a um, bit more power to it than than you see in this plan. And I like this plan. I like this work. CA Paul. Thank you. Through the chair. I agree. I personally don't believe truth and reconciliation in its own compartment. I believe that it is in every single one of these subjects. Mm -hmm. I also believe that climate action is in every single one of these subjects. I would I, I I would suggest perhaps that it's sustainability and climate action or climate action and sustainability as the as the head to, to bring that it forward. I do like the idea of having an overarching. And it could be argued always community well-being is in our advocacy, is in our responsible governance. It's in and that's the tricky part. Yeah. Is is in some way having having a way of saying these are not compartments; these are all overarching themes mm -hmm. that we do every day, and we touch upon. The so one of my suggestions might be that it for now, um, sustainable climate action and sustainability is is the title, and, and I don't want to get into problem solving, but I do see I do see it. I see it as a bit of a journey that we're going to go on. I would say, I. The vision for me is something this was created prior to me, and I would like to see in the next two years uh, the learning that we're going to do, the 
advocacy for climate action, the, the advocacy, the learning for under truth and reconciliation that we're going to do, we're going to see likely changes in our vision, understanding that when we say we're stewards of the region, what impact are we having on the original stewards of the, of the community, of the land that we're on? And I didn't want to insert that into this process and have it an evolution of the learning journey that we just learned from Jeanette that we'll all be on yeah. in the next two years. However, I think with climate action, you are right. It's been it's been discussed and committed to and learned it's the, the we're far more advanced on that portfolio to see it aligned with every single one of these subjects. Thank you. Other comments for Ms. Lester so I, I thank you for the for the reply, and I, I I think that might just be the easiest, you know, the is the best way to approach the easiest and best, which doesn't always happen. Uh, <laughs> those things that simultaneously. Um, so I'm happy with with that. Um, I did want to pick up on the common sense piece, and I think <laughs> I do think that one's that one's challenging, and and I mean, so many of the things we look at are subjective, but I would appreciate if we're going to we're evolving those pieces if there's another way to convey what we're trying to convey there I, I think we'd be well served with exploring that or having some options come back to us or some way of addressing that because that one is a bit um is a bit challenging and, and uh yeah i don't know, quite know what to do with that piece practical practical uh, yeah like it, there's all these things like does that mean fiscally does like within reason does it mean does it mean a simple solution versus that makes sense to someone, but then when you apply our technical reports, it doesn't, but common sense says you do this to get that. I don't know. Okay, director of the math. Just on the if I comment on the common sense piece. <laughs> Back a number of years when I was working, we ran the Zip Northwest Forestry Safety Seminar in Purley and Idaho. One of the uh, the session was on debunking common sense. <laughs> and it was very insightful. They went through a whole bunch of scenarios where people got hurt. The persons weren't trained. They didn't know. And, uh, you know, it's common sense that he should have known. It's common sense that he should have known. And it went over and over again. You either know or you don't know. And part of that is training and having data and everything else that goes along with it. So yes, it. Um, there's other questions for staff? Well, I, I think I have a, a question is with, with the feedback on the common sense piece, like is staff looking, the staff have the direction that they need to address, to address that in, in, in some way or like how to, We've got we've had one title change. I guess the question is likely for both the pieces where I feel we've had movement is adding the climate change and the sustainability category. Some some of that makes sense in that title, which I think is pretty easy. And then there's this common sense piece and how do we want to approach that? So I'm just not. I think that we spoke about. I just want to make sure we have to get the right direction and what what would be the next step if we wanted to address those two things. Because the recommendation is to. I would defer to the CAO for direction on that. Through the chair, I I would be happy to wordsmith common sense out of the values. Mm -hmm. And off the top of my head, I could come up. Part of me is saying using the best available information. Uh, for at at this time, we can we can do that. Firmly believe common sense is can be used in all, even people who don't agree with each other, and it's a very colonial. Bit. What is common to us might not be sure. common to others. Mm -hmm. So okay. I, I I think removing it or replacing it, I would be wary to replace it with another thing that yeah. you could say. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Um, something more inspiring. Would be good. I could just, I, I think 
when I look at the, the recommendation and next steps, I don't think that either of those changes really change the, um, the overall intent of the, of the document, but I think it's important that we do them and I'm happy to figure out a way, hopefully with the group that we can move this forward with those changes incorporated because the next steps are about sort of flow from, flow mm -hmm. from this. I don't think it's worth, yeah. like I don't feel that, I personally don't feel that strongly about it cool. that we delay this whole thing until we see the word. I'm happy to give that. I'm happy to give that um, that general direction. Um, reading it over my shoulder because my with the sleep <laughs> about the uh, the um, common sense and best available information. Like okay. I like removing okay. removing it and just get rid of it. Yeah, that available information it. data. Like I don't know. There's there might be an, an improvement just in that last piece. I'm trying to. You're hearing me thinking out loud, which happens often as far as how that relates to the to the the motions we have in front of us. So um could we agree to just delete both common sense and and just say using the best available information? I mean Mike's intuition. And my <laughs> and always thing, right? Yeah. Um. Yes. Maybe maybe I could say if we're talking about those those two pieces, I'm gonna take see if I can get this over the line. Yes. Is the first in the um, the Squamish Lower Regional District Board approved the strategic plan uh, and plan on a page uh, with the new purpose, prize, mission, and vision statements, instead of as presented, say, incorporating uh, feedback in the meeting, which I think we, the group, I only heard feedback on those two pieces. So if that's specific enough, then um, then the others flow from, from there. All right. So that way I don't have to wordsmith, the potential wordsmithing, that makes sense. So that'll be my, that works. my motion incorporating feedback uh, of the board in the meeting today. Good motion, I'll second that. Excellent, Thank you. okay, so. And I won't even take the opportunity to speak to it because I think I just did that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Director Herford. Okay, so that's moved and seconded. We're just talking about the first that or all three of them? My intent was all together. All right, all three that's. And Director Pettigill? Yeah, happy to support this. Um, I appreciate the, the changes to the, the resolution. I, just for my own, if you sort of want to reiterate, I know, notice that, you know, no one picked up the first thing I mentioned, I guess I'm a little unclear because my sense of this room is we are all really pulling in the same direction. And so I have great comfort with the group for there. Not sure if the document says that, which is like, oh, are, are we really, or is there some, is this is something we just don't want to talk about today. Um, and so maybe this is something then to just dig into, you know, with some of our upcoming work, or just, you know, and it's maybe just my lack of clarity. Cause again, I feel like we're all actually really working well together in the same direction, but you know, we can have that discussion then. Can you just ask for clarity? Like, is, sorry, is there a, a word or is there a sentence that in particular that you're speaking to? Uh, yeah, it's just the, in the first vision, it says cooperation and cohesive and cohesive and particular to me sort of implies same direction. The other one talks about collaborate and engage and then diverse, distinct, which has more implication of, you no, know, there's more like not going the same way, working well together, but not maybe in the same direction necessarily. And so it's just not entirely clear to me philosophically where we are. Again, my experience is that we are all going in the same direction with differences, but <laughs> it seems like it's, it's hard to even articulate. Uh, but yeah, just sort of wanting to, you know, uh, have that discussion at some point, maybe. Yes, just for a point of clarification, if I if I'm hearing correctly, I think what we're talking about is potentially a bit of a combination of that current vision, mm -hmm. and then maybe a little bit from the proposed. Um, the second statement in the new proposed vision is pulled directly from the RGS that our vision for the region is one of one comprised of diverse. Um, so if the board uh, preferred, we could remove that again um, from, we could take that out again from the sufficient statement. Um, I think um, 
further to Director Damaris earlier comment, we did really want to capture that all levels of government um, in this piece. So could it potentially be um, something that's a combination of the of the two? So maybe um, the Squamish Lillooet Regional District will lead regional governments. Um, that's yeah. Um, sorry. But if, if just not in that vision statement where it says regional governance by promoting collaboration and cohesive engagement among amongst its members. Just add the cohesive and that's all it really needs. And see well. I might also suggest asking ourselves why was collaboration and engagement put in place of cooperation and cohesive. And do we just put it back? I, I, I wasn't in the strategic planning session, so I don't know. Okay. Yeah, uh, collaboration and engagement were two words that came out a lot um, in that process that were highlighted um, mm -hmm. repeatedly. Um, so that's why they were. So I appreciate the discussion. I actually appreciate uh, Director DeMare's suggestion, uh, the CAO's suggestion. Mm -hmm. I am happy with the motion presented and we could sort of take this last piece in, in the follow-up. Uh, wanted to just at least highlight it. So if other people want this change now then, but I will support the resolution that's on the floor now as well, so. Director Crofton. Um, Thank you, Chair. Looking at the strategic priority areas, my recollection of our strategic planning was that we came out with governance excellence, like we had like three or four priority areas that we had agreed to, and now I see six, and governance excellence isn't one of them. I'm wondering if I just missed the step. Responsible governance and service excellence on the right. Okay, so how did, did did we not have like three things that we came up with and now we have six? Was there a process to get from here to there, or is this what came out of the conversation with Mr. McIntosh? Like, didn't we adopt a report back from the strategic planning process? Um, I believe the report, um, numerous reports that were developed came yeah. before the strategic planning. Um, so I think it was last February, March, um, when the former CAO presented the package of documents that became the um, corporate action plan, um, our, our uh, quarterly reports to the public, Mm -hmm. um, and so there were some priority areas identified in there that came out of, um, uh, I believe they were existing work plans and the, the work that was sort of already um, underway. And so these are new. So and this these um, six pillars or priority areas came out of those the later sessions that we did, um, where um, we didn't actually get to the point of really focusing in on those. But when we went back and looked at all of the um, many, many, many things that were highlighted, um, we themed them under these six sort of categories. So that's where that governance excellence, um, service capacity alignment, performance management. So those were already referenced on that um, the one page action plan that um, the former CAO had developed. Mm -hmm. um, and then we've captured those under that category of responsible governance and service excellence. I guess I'm comfortable. I, I feel like we we were pretty thorough in that process and we like adopted reports and we did a lot of made a lot of progress that was took a lot of like time and energy and meetings and all kinds of other stuff. And we're going to adopt this now, which as I look at it and hear the thoughts on it, 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 it resonates for me, but I would love to see 
this beside the outcomes of the meetings we had with Mr. McIntosh, the all of the work product of all of the stuff that we did to get here. Um, just because I think that those like strategic planning retreats and, and, and that kind of work is really important because it says, are we all on the same page? We are. Remember, we threw all, we took stickies and put them all over walls and it was a very comprehensive process. Um, Chair, I, and I'm coming in a little late on the game. Um, and I, when you say that some of the documents and stuff, the, the templates that have been created for the corporate action plan and the work plans, um, though that's referenced. And I, I just from my personal experience, usually the strategic plan is first and adopted, and then it flows down. What's okay. How the, how and the do. It feels like it kind of went a bit opposite when we started with creating the work plans and creating the corporate action plans. And those are referenced in one of the slides in the secular visual of the slides where we have those and now it's the strategic plan that, that was pretty much developed under that vision but needed to be put in a plan and the direction was we need one page that shows what our strategic plan is, reminding us of our vision, reminding us of our purpose, and what our pillars are. Or we'll say pillars, not categories, what our pillars are. And so I think where my, I think I share your confusion, because where my confusion was, was that those documents were created prior to the adoption of the strategic plan. So the, the, all of that work what fed into those documents. And now we're kind of going into the middle here and saying, okay, and also this is a strategic plan. But I don't believe the documents contradict the strategic plan. You just don't know, like, I think you're right. That was the process that Gord decided to take was to talk about actual action items that wanted accomplished. But the final outcome, from what I remember, was a strategic here are our three priority areas. We're going to do this big thing, this big thing, and this big thing. And well, there's all kinds of stuff that flows out of it. And so if we didn't have strategic priority areas in this document, the document would make a lot of sense to me. The fact that we do, and I'm wondering, well, what were the strategic priorities that area that we are replacing or, or actually just... Um, renewing a commitment to because that's a good point people point to the upper right corner yes governance excellence is there and that reflects what i remember um i i guess i'm hung up on i thought we had three priority areas and now we have six and it feels like we've done that very very quickly without the same kind of rigor that we went through previously Ms. Westerholm, and then jen and chris and yeah, and through the CAO, um, and looking at that 2023 action plan, which yeah. was that one-page document that um, the former CAO had developed after that December session, um, we had listed um, priorities as regional um, a, a government, governance excellence initiative, regional transit, indigenous, indigenous relations plan, affordable housing, service capacity alignment. So all of those things do fall under these pillars. So the pillars are really... Um, and it may be that the board wishes to, you know, one year you might choose to focus on one pillar. Maybe all of the work in one year is going to be around advocacy. Maybe you will direct that one year it will all be around climate action. Um, but this was a way to capture all of those um, items that came out of those um, numerous strategic planning workshops mm -hmm. that were highlighted um, by the board as areas to um, of priority. So instead, of, we could have had, um, you know, we could have went individually and had 88 um, minority areas, <laughs> just to throw a number out there. But this was a good way to um, be able to group them together by themes um, as they appeared throughout that process, if that helps. But again, further to um, CAO Paul's comment, I don't believe any of this contradicts that um, one page strategic priority document. Sorry, I could pull it up. 
Yeah. Oh, okay. We've got uh, a good reference back to what you're looking for. I can see what you're seeing. Yeah. So it is a link within the report. So oh, what I tried to find um, where is it? Yeah, so it is like the 2023 action plan. And if I go to the report that uh, Patricia provided us um, under October 25th, 2023, there was a board meeting where the board received yes. an information report regarding the Q3 performance. And I believe there's one attachment um, that shows that one pager that the past CAO had presented to the board outlining the information um, that the consultant board Macintosh had sort of all pulled together. So the the now regional board priorities, mm -hmm. number one being governance excellence initiative, number two, regional transit, three, indigenous relations plan, four, affordable housing, and five, service capacity alignment. And that was in the top box. Yeah. And then there were timelines associated mm -hmm. with all of them. I, through the through the chair, I wish I wish we could pull it up so I could I could show you. Uh, but if we look at it, the gray areas are board priorities, and you see the now, the next, and the advocacy. So there are. I feel like all of this is reflected in the strategic plan. Um, unless there's something else you're visualizing that might have been from Mr. McIntosh's report. No, this this makes sense to me. Um, like as I read it, l l what really got me excited through that whole process was this board's commitment to one in five. The other stuff felt like advocacy, you know, we're well, maybe not indigenous relations, but certainly affordable housing and regional transit. Like these are things that we're going to advocate for and work towards. But it felt like we had a moment mm -hmm. through that process where we all said, aha, we need to focus on ensuring that we're effective around this table and that we're honest about the capacity that we have and that that would be a major step ahead for our organization and if we focused on you know lying at a strategic level at this table and being realistic and honest about our capacity to deliver on all the things that we're doing we would take massive steps ahead and those should be our strategic priorities and that felt really strong at the time. And I still find it compelling because we still have way more that we want to do than we have capacity for. And we still have a tendency to get tactical. And so um, I just don't want that lost, I guess. And so for me, I feel like the report lays it out well and the strategic priorities for me um, I, I would be happy for two <laughs> or three, maybe a third that would be advocacy and, and one would be capacity alignment. The other would be um, governance excellence and, and the third being advocacy. But to Chris's point, the last thing I want to do is like hang up this whole process. So if we all agree that we're going down that path anyway and that those six things reflect the big ahas we had at the beginning of this term, I think I'm I'm comfortable. The CAO, could I suggest that um, the third that is um, that staff report back to the board at a future meeting with updated performance reports, including that um, action plan for 2024. Could I suggest that the this 20 the 20 this action plan updated for 2024 becomes the second page of that plan on page? So it's two plans on page. Um, so the plan on the page is the really high level. Here's our vision, mission, values. 
This is the hierarchy of plans. These are the pillars. And then the second page of that becomes the 2024 action plan that is a little bit more focused. Much. Well, I don't want to. Like my, my 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 preference would be to just confirm what you've done here because you've this is very strategic for us, and almost affirm it as long as there's a lot of clarity that one in five are gonna be. You know, to me, that was the big pieces of this. One in five were like the things that we didn't realize about ourselves before the beginning of this term. And then we realized it about ourselves and we decided we needed to do something about it. And so if you can reflect that in the strategic priority, I'd be comfortable with it. It seems to me that, yes, you can make a case for it being already there. Just don't want to miss it or lose it especially the capacity alignment. Like we have so much work to do. Okay, so thank you. And that might be, it may be adequate to just with the addition of saying, incorporating the feedback at the meeting, but there's still Director Penningale and Hereford wanting to speak yet yeah, and Director DeMuth. Yeah, my, my recollection, and I always get caught up in semantics in these strategic planning discussions. I think most people do. Um, probably me especially, but from my mind, you know, we we had to work with Mr. McIntosh. I, I seem to recall further board discussions and follow up. Um, for me, the document we're talking about today and notwithstanding some of the things I raised, this is a really good summary of why, why we're here. Um, and you know, it reflects my expectation that staff was taking all those discussions and sy synthesizing that. And then what I see in the action plan, which we absolutely endorsed and talked about, is some of, it's a little more tactical. It's the the what, the how, and and naturally falls under the strategic planning document we're talking today. And, and so we're not aiming to address everything in, in what we might approve today. Here, here's the focus on tactically in terms of actual work plan. These are the where their practical focus is going to be as an organization uh, to achieve the higher why over time. I'm seeing the, and that's just how I think about these documents and their purpose. And maybe that's not shared. So for me, what we have here, it all makes sense. It, it fits together um, and it's not one or the other. They're, they both go together in my mind. Mike. Yeah, that's some pretty similar to what I would, where I was going to go. I like Patricia's idea of, of the two page, one page you're having and on the other side. I think it's something people want to see. John led with that, you know, seeing what actions and timelines come out of a strategic plan as opposed to just being the fluffy document on the shelf. So I, I think it, it, it creates a good balance. I think they go hand in hand. I think they, they fit all together, as Chris said. And, um, um, and I agree with a lot of Director Crompton's comments, uh, but I think those other three items need to be in there as well. I think one and five are very important as 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 uh, work we've done, but I think those other priorities are priorities that were established by the board through our through our sessions. Um, you know, we get a letter back tomorrow from the provincial government a positive letter with regards to regional transit, there's going to, that's going to be a priority that's going to require work from our staff and from the board. So I think it needs to be up there as one of those priorities, similar with, with number three and number four. Affordable housing is something we talk about every 10 minutes. Um, so I think that needs to be up there. So I, I agree with your comments, Jack. I, I, I see why that's important to you. I would be I would be a little reluctant to remove any of those other items on there, though, and just go with the two. I think if we go back to back on the document, it spells it out, out pretty clearly. Um, it does, you know, looking at this does take me back to Chris's original comment, but no, there's nothing mentioned about climate one to five. Um, but uh, yeah, <laughs> other than that, I like the idea of bringing them together. Okay. Okay, climate has been incorporated as 
it's a stronger statement. Director de Miller and then Director Thompson. Yeah, I'm, I'm in favor of moving this forward with a few amendments that we have. <clears throat> but one of the keys is that is that uh, is is the work plan and and being able to link each activity that's in there to one of these strategic priorities that we have here, so that when the public sees it, when it's presented to the to the board, of course the public can see it. And having a column that has, and we mentioned this before, that actually links each task to one of these priorities that we have here. So we understand, um, so that the community can understand what we're working on, why we're working on these various tasks. And I think with the new uh, uh, program that we've got, uh, it'll have that capability to do that. And uh, that's to me, one of the most important. That was number 10 for me of all the things that we did at the workshop was getting that program initiated and working. And hopefully it'll be done by the end of the year, I presume, because that's a key for, uh, for staff to really uh, develop that program to its most capacity in use. Thank you. Sure. Um, in implementation discussion, I'm sorry, Director Miller, I'm reluctant to say summer because yeah. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Crompton. This went exactly the opposite direction I'd hoped it would be. <laughs> <laughs> the last thing I want to do is continue to micromanage mm -hmm. an action plan. Like I the, the whole goal for me was to say we need this to be a strategic plan that gives high level direction. And what we're gonna do is add a back piece that allows us to go. And so my preference is to go with the original. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, I, this is not what I was saying. So. Thank you, I'm quite happy with the plan on the page. And I think I have uh, Director Hoff fully up in there. I don't know if you can back up on that, but <laughs> um, so the way I, I felt that I, when we were doing all these uh, strategic planning, is one in five governance <laughs> excellence and service capacity that all the decisions that we made at this table, that was kind of woven into the fabric of our decision making. So governance excellence into regional transit and indigenous relations and that's how i saw it so maybe i i saw it a little bit differently but i think that everything that we have as our priorities no matter what they are should be led with first of all you know governance excellence and service capacity for staffing and and that so i don't know yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Just um, maybe this goes to that governance excellence piece. When I made the motion, mm -hmm. generally directors' comments on motions are not the motion that was captured. So I want to make sure we know what it is we're voting on now, yes. because to me the conversation has wandered. Yes. And I appreciate that. And maybe the motion was too too early. But when I said incorporating the feedback that we heard i picked two spots and that was seconded so that was where i feel we are mm -hmm. and if we're somewhere else then we need to go back in the motion to reflect that because i think we went a little bit further than i'm comfortable with in a debate on a motion because we were providing feedback including a quite a lot of, of stuff which was appropriate to answer the, the pieces of clarity but I want to make sure we know what we're voting on. That's all I'm, I'm saying it, that for this piece of it. So, um, and, but speaking of emotion, which I said I wouldn't do <laughs> earlier, uh, I think that um, given that we've been, all efforts have been made to advance this and keep the organization moving throughout this, pro this process, I get that the strategic plan is generally 
first. And however, we need to put this strategic plan in so that the rest of the process can start aligning with that. And I get that we started from the wrong place, that from a, a slightly out of order, but that doesn't mean that, that um, to me, that means that over time, we need to adjust that. And work plans are gonna start reflecting the strategic plan, even though they're speaking to each other backwards now, and that'll start aligning. I see that aligning, needing to align over time, just by the nature of what those documents are set to, to, um, to do. So I'm comfortable with, what was there, or my original intent. And then um, there was the piece, uh, although I will modify it, uh, I'd like to amend my motion to include the piece around the, the um, that was a cooperation or sorry, your, um, I like that cohesive with some language around cohesiveness. So that's the three pieces that, so that adds that third piece, if that's a friendly, my second or it's okay with that. And so, uh, yeah, Angela, yeah, um, through the chair, yes. um, I think okay. that the original motion captures that as because we do have incorporating feedback received from the board. So, yeah, just yeah. When, when it gets to the debate, to like it's like up to that point because often when we go, I've seen and it, I didn't really feel it necessarily here, but I've been in other rooms where the comments are meant to be the directions. Of, well, I don't necessarily agree with that. So then. Now it turns into this whole thing. So like up to that point in time was my was my intent so that comments are on that feedback that's provided up to that up to that point. But yes, I did leave it very general, didn't I? So I left it open for those comments. But um yeah, so the motions are as you see in your package with with the addition that Director Herford changed on the first that it's no longer as presented, but rather. The revised vision and mission statement. So, incorporating the feedback at the meeting yeah. from the directors. Which I meant to say before, I mean, like, yes. that was provided before. <clears throat> and so, that has been moved and seconded, and it does cover the conversation that came afterwards. I think that's the problem. That's the problem. Yeah. That's, it that, that's my point. Yeah. It covers too much of the conversation. Mm -hmm. I think Herbert is trying to say when he made the motion, it was about two, now three pieces. Okay. We continue to talk at length. All right. We got this other slide up. Yeah. Honestly, this had nothing to do with my original motion. Exactly. So I, I, and I don't know how, what well, that motion would look like. So what I'm. The three points being um, to work on common sense. And the climate action, action to be strengthened. And then the cohesive, cohesive something engagement. that conveys the cohesiveness of the of of the earth. Those are the three, those are the three points um that I had in, intended I, to be included in seconded. incorporating feedback and that. Is that understood, Miss um, Westerholm? Those those three areas, and so with that understanding, are we happy with the the motion as as general as it is? Okay. In that case, it's been moved and seconded. I don't think I should call it. <laughs> uh, is anyone opposed? And I don't see the screen anymore, so I don't actually call that. Wait. No, I'm just, I'm still here. I don't oppose. You don't oppose. Okay. Then that's unanimously passed. Thank you. I, I really have to ask Patricia, did we just, are you leaving more confused than you walked in? Okay. <laughs> very generous. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> My friends are alumni. That should be our whole thing. Out. That should be the strategic plan. <laughs> Work on common sense. <laughs> Okay, we have a couple more items right now. We uh, get the whole agenda. Um, the records reports. I don't believe we have any. No, I do not have anything. We do not have anything on late business here, although we will have something when we get back to the regular agenda. So, no late business. So, a motion to adjourn the committee of the whole.
Richard, thank you. Second by Director Bobbin. If anyone opposed, you can bring the committee up the poll. Thank you. The next item, if we go back into our regular meeting, we're at item 8.8. .8. <laughs> Which is application to the UBCM disaster risk reduction climate adaptation plan. And we'll wait for Mark. Eight point eight is our eight point eight, yeah. And then we have nine point two, nine point three. Welcome, Mr. Billups and Mr. Butt. We're on item 8.8 .8 on the agenda on the UBCM Disaster Risk Reduction and Climate Adaptation Fund. I'd like to turn it over to you. Perfect. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, thank you, Chair, and I uh, thank you, Board, for your time. Um, this uh, RFD is related to an application to the UBCM Disaster Risk Reduction Climate Adaptation Fund. Uh, so in collaboration with the SLRD Environmental Services and with the Pemberton Valley Diking District, uh, the SLRD uh, Protective Services Department wishes to submit an application uh, in two categories for two separate projects uh, to the Disaster Risk Reduction Climate Adaptation Fund. Uh, so, first project uh, is uh, related to a regional disaster debris management plan, uh, category one foundational activity. Uh, the purpose of this project is to develop a business continuity plan for the loss of SLR, SLRD debris related infrastructure and plan for a large scale uh, disaster debris disposal. I think the, the events of last summer, um, although kind of a bit smaller in terms of the actual amount of debris we had, really highlighted the need for us to have a, a solid plan about how we will deal with this in the future. Uh, so this project will support the development of a regional disaster debris management plan um, that and will support the coordination of efforts and resources between local and regional partners. So this uh, project not only will help uh, ensure that the facilities that the SLRD operates have continuity plans and emergency management plans associated with those facilities, but it will be working with uh, the member municipalities to ensure that we are able to, under if there is a loss of one facility, that we have plans in place to uh, kind of adapt and adjust how we manage disaster debris. Uh, this, so this project will be led by the Environmental Services Department and the Protective Services Department will uh, support them. Uh, the second project, uh, which this application includes, is a Category 2. It's a non-structural activity uh, project. Uh, so this uh, project proposes uh, to improve the monitoring capability of Mount Meager uh, in partnership with local and Indigenous uh, governments, Simon Fraser University, and Interjex. Uh, with this funding, uh, the Pemberton Valley Decking District uh, will be able to add more infrasound and seismic equipment uh, on Mount Meager, as well as a broader communication network to expand uh, modern capabilities. Uh, so this will allow for remote triggering uh, of a signal to alert the PVDD that an event has occurred on Mount Meager, and will also amplitude, uh, provide uh, an amplitude and a rough area of occurrence. Uh, so uh, this is this project again is it's important for uh, the SLRD, uh, Lua Nation, and uh, the village of Pemberton. Uh, so if, if successful, the PVDD will oversee this project, and uh, again, the yeah, Protective Services Department will support them uh, in doing so. Happy to take any questions. Yeah, thank you. Both both of these projects sound um, very important and and supportable. Uh, I'm curious. So in, we have a, you know, the, this regional district is just so massive. How does, I'd just like to understand how staff prioritize, like how do these rise to the, to the top and uh, of what's likely a, 
endless list of, of mm -hmm. challenges and, and hazards and, and so on. So yeah, just if you could help me understand the, the prioritization and um, uh, it would be helpful. Yeah, so um, I will hand it over to Omar in a second. But in terms of the uh, regional disaster remanagement uh, project, I think, again, it was highlighted this summer and I learned a lot more about some of the challenges associated with debris uh, than I ever thought I would. Uh, it is complicated. Uh, there's many regulations and considerations and partners that are involved in doing so. Uh, I understand that in the past that there was fifty thousand uh, dollars kind of uh, put aside to support uh, the environmental services uh, department in doing this, as it was recognized as a need uh, previously. Uh, and obviously, this grant funding uh, allows us to kind of push it uh, further and uh, allows us to actually bring on uh, some contractors to help us uh, do this work. Uh, maybe overall, yeah, it, it's it's something that's been on all our plan for a few years, no. and it kind of with all the stuff that comes up, it it kind of keeps getting. Pushed and this would really help, uh, like Mike, uh, Mark said, the wildfire situation last year really highlighted the need for <clears throat> that continuity plan. So if we do get this grant funding, it would really help us make sure we, we get that done. And there's a two year timeline for that. So yeah, it would, it would help, help us bring it to the top and, and ensure we get it. Yeah. I'd say in terms of the uh, Mount Meadering meager meager monitoring uh project uh that uh yeah obviously we have our experts in the Pemberton Valley Tech here uh, who know uh very well the hazards but I think uh, as we all know that Mount Meager is a, uh, a concern uh for us and uh and for the entire region and I think uh this uh and the partnerships through SFU and interjects uh really will help us push it forward so I think, uh, and a lot of the, the work is on the Pemberton Valley Dyking District to um, move this project forward. Um, I'd like to move both of these. Second. Second by Director Crompton. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, is there anyone opposed? That motion is carried. That's our approved. Thank you. Well, there are three. Do the third one as because it's different voting structure. They would even get the last resolution separately. So I need a motion to approve the chief administrative officer to be authorized. Okay. Perfect. Seconded by Director Mack. Second. Second by Director Crompton. Thank you. Thank you very much. We are jumping now to 9.2, the virtual information session for the Downtown Lake Wildfire Property Loss Group. We have Director Gamera back at the table. Go ahead, sir. Yes, um, I'll, I'll just read it. the resolution that the S30 Board of Directors support the S30 staff plan and execute. Delta Lake Wildfire virtual information session. This session is to update the property loss group on what the recovery team is still working on and an update dated sequence of permit studies and reports that they have been they have to undertake to get their properties back to self form that they can be used. This would also include anything related to interior health regulations on their rebuild. And that that session has a time at the end for question and answer. One of the things that um, happened during that wildfire um, was there was no staff present up in our area. And and uh, basically there were no, no meetings that were held with the, with the public. And, and we had a few um, you know, we had continual updates from, from the SLRD on uh, social media and, and other processes. But the 56 people that lost their properties have never actually had a session with staff. Talk about all the issues that they're going through and everything that, that has to transpire. They did have a session with the property loss group, there's a, a committee for it. And uh, they did have a session with them uh, virtually. 
but the rest of the property owners uh, that lost property really haven't been fully engaged with the staff. And it's time right now, if, if you were to go up there during your last visit, you'd be amazed at what's taken place there. Pretty well all those properties have all their trees taken down. Most of them got them removed now. And uh, it's a whole new world. And these people are about ready to start moving forward. And this is the time right now that we need to have this, this information session where they can ask questions. Well, it's just those property loss group people. That's all it's for. It's not for the whole of Gun Lake so that they get the information. So, yeah, I need, I would like the board to, uh, to approve it. So I'll make that motion as presented. Seconded by um, Director Mack. Uh, yes, Director Prompton. Uh, through the chair, why is a resolution like this required? The, the, res the resolution is to support work that is ongoing. The reason is, is they, they, they've never been able to ask questions face to face. And one of the one of the things that happens when you have a session like that is when the questions, first of all, they give that presentation and then you're able to ask questions and everybody gets to hear those questions. So everybody's learning at the same time of you know what what is actually going on. Having something on uh, a newsletter or whatever is not the same. Sorry, the, the yeah. motion says support staff's plan. So is it staff's intention to do That's, this meeting? No, that staff, SLD staff plan and execute the virtual session. So I'm asking the board to support this resolution that staff plan and execute on a virtual information session. I see. And so if we're asking staff to do something, then we should ask the CAO to address the question of capacity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, through the chair. I fully respect the need and the, the spirit of Director DeMar's request. My concern with a motion like this is that this is the do. Mm -hmm. And my feeling is it needs to be addressed in the quarterly reviews and performance reviews of the CAO. Um, I would like to invite Mark to talk about the communications and the work being done and planned. <clears throat> I would say the first issue here is capacity. If I was going to build an ideal com communication in, a, in a community engagement department, it would have a lot more staff. And talking to other regional districts, when this came up, I made some phone calls to other regional districts and what they do. And, and it really is a big, it's a big pendulum of less than what we do and more than what we do. Um, some regional districts host monthly virtual meetings for their areas for, with staff, but they have a significant amount more staff capacity. Um, so my, my preference would be that our goal is to communicate and engage. That's part of our that's part of our work plan. That's part of our strategy, and how we're delivering it is reviewed to the CAO's performance. You're not engaging enough with the community. You're not allowing the questions. We need to address this. How do we do it? What roadblocks are in your way, and what can we do to make it better for the community? Because I agree, there's multiple ways to communicate. And we, because of capacity, have used the inroads of digital and also regionally, geographically, this is a difficult place to commit to constantly being up there. And then for safety during the fires, I was that question because I understand it. Um, I'm wondering if I could invite Mr. Phillips to talk a minute about that a little bit from some background, and then we could go on. Have some questions. If I could, just a quick point. Or this is an example. Like in our earlier discussion, we had a moved and seconded, and then we're having a step. So I, I think if we, I think to support a vote, 
we should just and procedurally, I'd like to right. for officer to keep us on the side. But I, I, in my experience, I, I feel more comfortable if the motion was um, um, stepped back at this point, and then we can have a bigger conversation. I don't think we're ready to have a vote. And now we're having more information than just a debate amongst the direct, the direct, the directors. So I don't think we're at vote point. So I, I really appreciate. I would like that, that to come back, and then, you. and then we can get to that. That book that feels like what's that feels like what's happening to yeah. me, but that's true. No, for procedure, you're completely correct. I'll, I'll take it back. So that for the, for the moment you're receiving that motion yep. so that we can have a discussion and ask staff <clears throat> any questions. And yep. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Okay. And so Mark, please proceed. Thank you. Um, through the chair. Um, I would say that our our team uh continues to be available. That we have We've reached out uh, one on one uh, to these residents through phone calls, and we've done follow up uh, to all of the residents as well to uh, provide updates. And also, uh, we continue to make ourselves available uh, for those residents to ask any questions or receive uh, any clarification. Uh, we uh, are having a, or the province is hosting a town hall uh, next week, uh, which will be focused on the geotechnical uh, components. And there will be, uh, there will be some other information available related to water quality and other other things that have been worked on. Um, I think it, it, I think the capacity is, is, a, is consideration is that uh, fully appreciate that we need to ensure that we're communicating uh, clearly to these folks. We have put out a newsletter this morning uh, providing the updates and the kind of key uh, areas of work uh, that we've been focused on. And I think it's also that a lot of these pieces are uh, not necessarily within our our area and that they take months and the riparian piece was six months of work uh, focused work by our team of pushing these things forwards um so it is we we don't have a lot of the answers and we've communicated that we don't have the answers and we've we've communicated the areas that we are focusing on and our understanding of the needs um i do just recognize that even in terms of just supporting the province's town hall, it's been a few weeks of work. Mm -hmm. um, if we were to host our own, there is uh, there is obviously the uh, there's the we have to coordinate it uh, and get a support from probably an AB individual as well as uh, probably a few weeks of uh, the protective service team as well as UBS um, uh, communications and others building and planning as well. I know the building and planning team is also available um, should there be any questions about permitting, but I think the permitting process does follow, and I, I don't want to speak for them, but it, it does follow this the, the regular uh, kind of permitting process that uh, all uh, kind of residents across the SLRD um, follow. I think that's... Okay. Uh, Thanks, Chair. I'm curious to know the... Uh, provincial session that we've just heard about for next week does it include a remote component can people participate virtually is that something we know at this point <laughs> yeah uh, through the chair uh it so the province is using a teams platform uh for this uh the town hall uh questions uh will be through kind of a type of questions uh, and then they'll be brought to uh the panel okay so as a follow-up uh, I'd, I'd like to hear uh, staff comparison of what's being proposed here at our table compared to the provincial session. Are, are the goals and objectives similar? Do they match up nicely? Or are we talking about two very different sessions? Um, through the chair, I would... Um... I think Director Mayor probably in terms of his vision, I think probably has what he's looking for. I think the uh, the purpose, the the primary purpose of this provincial town hall is to uh, for them to communicate uh, the findings of the post wildfire fire uh, natural hazard reports. So that is the primary purpose. Uh, understanding uh, that there's lots of related uh, topics uh, uh, that are involved here in terms of potentially riparian. Um, uh, yeah, cleanup activities, uh, water quality uh, impacts, things like that. But there is an opportunity for uh, questions to be answered uh, on that. Um, I don't know if they uh, completely align in terms of direction. Uh, I might like to hear Director Demare's thoughts on that question. Yeah, the 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 intent of of the one next week as as. Uh, 
Director Phillips has stated, is the geotechnical report. <clears throat> and there are 19 properties that were highlighted in that report that may have issues due to the streams coming down off, off of Mount Pernos. So that's the, the gist of that session. Wasn't intended to deal with some of these issues that all the uh, 56 property owners that were affected have. Mr. Chair, and what what the what we have pushed back and requested is we don't want to sit. Not everyone understands that's a province that's the SOME. Yeah, that's the province that's, that's the SOME. That's the so thing. what we have said is we we are going to have building protective services recovery and myself there because we don't want what will likely happen is many questions that aren't related to the geotech. We don't want. That's not the place. This is not the place. It'll just be so we have asked that we're there and we'll choose if it's really ro if it's really robust, we might say, hey, here's Mark's number. Give him a call. <laughs> <laughs> well, just to be clear, his number is on every single newsletter. The yes. rest of the information. Um, so we didn't want it to be a situation where we just be like, no, no, we're not talking about that. So we've hybrided it in a way where we still want the province to be the primary and we're there for it. QAs. Director Hereford. Yeah, I'm Thank you. If I'm, director. if I'm understanding, I'm trying to go to say at the appropriate level, if I'm understanding this correctly, and, and I, I like that approach, if we're getting to hypotheticals, if we come away from that session being like, wow, those there's an overwhelming amount of questions for us, then this what's being something like what's being proposed could be an action that flows on the tail, on the coattails of that, or perhaps that hybrid address may end up addressing some of the concerns. So it's like a I, I feel like we're getting the cart before the horse on being prescriptive on what the next step is versus this hybrid piece. Is that is that how you're you're seeing that through the chair yeah yeah Maybe. what i really like to ask the board however is i think that director demar's suggestion is excellent we don't have the money or the capacity to do it i think his suggestion is excellent for many communities in many areas that would like virtual sessions to talk about what's going on in their community yeah. um or specific to if we have to, if it goes to the C level X, then the X men on virtual sessions would be. It's about budget and capacity. Or what do we take off in order for this to be focused on? And my concern is we're going into fire season and I can't take off getting ready for that. So the, the pri it, when, when everything is said and done, a lot of the priority of Director Phillips' team would be in emergency response um, and recovery. We've been in recovery for since October. We've been managing recovery. And this is an overall strategic. If we want to go back to a strategic conversation, we're in a Ferris wheel of we're in recovery and then recovery. And so what would address that is a capacity where, you know, actually you, your focus is prevention and recovery all the time. And we have EOC dedicated. Um, that's that's I think where this conversation could be is where what what it, our, one of our goals is to engage more in the community in virtual public Q and A sessions. That that's a good goal. And or one of the focuses can be, you know, one off we'll we'll put capacity and we'll put to this. Yeah. I well, actually, I I have speakers list. Okay. If you wanted to just respond to that particular thing, and then I'll yes. Can I respond to that? Yeah. I, I think if we go back to the strategic plan that we just looked at, where's our responsibility to the community? Should that that is the number one responsibility that we have? Are we meeting that with this group? And we'll ask that question to the board. Because uh, you're right. 
It is. This is very important. This is just the first major one that the SRD has had. And are we fulfilling our commitment? Um, I mean, we, we've been talking about recovery for a while in terms of being just as important as response. And so I think, you know, Director Damaris is, is pointing to some needs from his residents. I'm hearing some real capacity issues and we're trying to get ready for next fire season. Um, so I guess I would love to stop to say, you know, there's some needs from that community in terms of, of where to go next and, and you're looking for some direction. You know, putting a town hall like this together is a substantial amount of work. I'm hearing capacity and budget issues. And is there another suggestion from staff in terms of how to perhaps uh, work towards, you know, solving some of these these uh, outstanding concerns for those residents. Can we can we um, find another way or just have other, other ideas how to, how to attack this? I guess would be my question. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, through the chair, I, I the idea of uh, the director for the mentioned about uh, understanding what what comes up at this uh, the town hall that is already uh, scheduled for April third and fourth, um, and seeing uh, if there are a number of outstanding questions or if there was an overwhelming a number of questions that were not able to be answered uh, during that session, uh, maybe a, a a reasonable way to understand the needs uh, going forward. Is, I, mean, I think I agree that uh, the regular communication on the stuff. Um, is necessary. I I think uh, depending on the type of information uh, that we have available, uh, I think if there's different communication channels that may be more appropriate uh, versus a town hall is one uh, option for getting this information out to the community. I think uh, I would add, I think the our team is uh, very uh, uh, understanding of the challenges in the community. And uh, for the riparian thing, I think it, it is recognizing the amount of work that we are pushing and changing provincial regulations in, in you know what I mean, to to address the the asks of that community. And it's a, it's not an easy thing to do. Um, so I think we do here, but these things do take time and uh, and they take focus to actually achieve it. So there's there's the opportunity cost that I think is, is also necessary to kind of consider on these things. Um, so having heard, heard that, I, I very much empathize with South, you know, what, he, what you're trying to do and, and respond to the needs of your residents. I also, you know, I'm hearing staff very clearly. Um, personally, perhaps uh, I would think that maybe the, the road forward would be that let's have this town hall set up through the province. Let's see what comes out of it. Let's give staff, and so I'll channel director Demer a chance to hear that, process it, and decide what information and what, what needs need to be met. Uh, and then I would like to hear back from staff as, uh, as a plan. Town hall could be one option. Staff might have some other uh, ideas or opportunities how to address the needs. So my suggestion, because I'm hearing from both sides, would be to, to wait out the provincial session, assess the needs from there you guys have conversations and sort of perhaps come up with another plan to address those needs if that's if that's a palatable way to move forward thank you director Richmond. and i have director matt director hopko director morden and then director Pettinger. yeah i think with uh the follow-up to these issues uh disasters whatever you want to call them um I think the province and in some cases the federal government has to be more engaged and there has to be a timeline <clears throat> on their part of how long it takes them to get engaged. Because look at Lit, it's still a gravel pit, right? And in uh, Merritt, okay. there's there's issues with their infrastructure that's now almost three years old. Um, <clears throat> the politicians seem to show up when the disaster happens or shortly thereafter to get their photo ops and promise all kinds of money and all this stuff. And then they disappear. And years later, <clears throat> we're still trying to fix this stuff. So I think whether we go through the UBCM or however, we need to pressure the province and the feds, the, the people that are responsible, mm -hmm. that they have to get their act together 
and do this in a in a timeline like all these folks that have lost their homes <clears throat> all across the country i'm sure they're in the same boat and it's just it's not right to leave people hanging and and it's not right to allow rumors to start because somebody isn't giving them you know the right uh, information and giving it to them uh, on a more personal level not uh you know with an email or mm -hmm. whatever there needs to be um yeah more engagement with the people that are affected personally Anyways. I'm good, actually. Both of my comments were. Thank you. Um, the Casper Creek fire was um, on our doorstep at our family cottage, um, so I can sympathize, well, almost sympathize, sympathize how you, your community is feeling. Um, and I'm wondering, if, from what it sounds like at this town hall, the people they want to answer, ask questions to are going to be there. Um, so I can understand asking questions during it, but what about having a option afterwards, an allocated time to the 56 property owners that were lost, that were lost and them being able to ask questions directly? Because it sounds like it's all there. The, the staff is there, the EV, the equipment's all there, everything's there. So is it not possible to do it then? Um, through the chair. Um, <clears throat> these are occurring next week on mm -hmm. um, April 3rd and 4th. I, it, to do a, uh, depending on the scope of this, mm -hmm. uh, there would be planning that's required. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the the general questions about recovery, I think there there will be space uh, during the the provincial town hall to ask mm -hmm. a number of those questions, mm -hmm. and hopefully uh, they can be addressed. Uh, yeah, adequately. So. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. Yeah, I can just understand how they would feel frustrated if they didn't want their specific time rather than with, because we don't know how many people are going to show up to this. So, and their questions might not get answered in an allocated time. So to have half an hour afterwards for 56 people to be like, this is what I want to know. I think that might be reasonable to ask. I don't, but I don't, this process is out of my scope. Yeah, to the chair. Uh, the format will be all, all questions that, uh, are written, uh, will be, you know, they, they're able to write in any question they okay. wish. We will, we will be able to capture those questions if they are answered or not answered, and which, uh, to, uh, to the discussion before, potentially be a way for us to understand. Uh, yeah, it is a two hour session, uh, already, which I think is adequate time for, uh, quite a wholesome, uh, yeah, discussion with the community. Mm -hmm. Okay, I do like, um, Director Richmond's, um, suggestion with that um to get a sense of, of how many more yeah. there are yeah. in the session yes i'm sure you're planning on doing that anyway okay. i have director pettingill yeah a couple of things i, I appreciate doc uh, director richmond's suggestion it makes sense to me it sounds like actually this might be almost exactly what director de is asking for and and so i would like to to uh, give that a chance to to play out, and hopefully, you know, uh, Director Jamer can encourage people to attend. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm hoping to attend at least one of them. Um, I am just sort of reflecting on the discussions over the last two days, um, and I know for myself, even come from the municipal context, understanding the budgeting and differences in strategic planning and so on. But you know, to my mind, the the question was raised a few times yesterday in terms of budget, like, do we need to be putting more money this year into emergency response and planning and so on? And I think I sort of understood that from staff, we are putting some in for this coming year. We want to understand a little bit better before a bigger ask is probably coming. Uh, but as a board, we didn't push back and say, hey, we know there's these other needs that we're not feeling we're able to meet. And so we declined to add more to this year's budget when we had the chance. Um, we just talked about the strategic priority areas and it does have emergency planning response and recovery it talks more specifically where our focus is in that we talked about the action plan and, you know, to my mind, it, maybe this is just sort of for us as a, a group to think about governance excellence and so on. I think those are pre 
uh, prior, uh, main opportunities to sort of identify these sorts of gaps that we're seeing. And uh, I think, and I'm speaking more generally here, was sort of request, I think, identifying the need uh, and sharing some of the needs with the group is, is critical. I think it does become a bit problematic when we're asking staff to do specific things. I think our job is to identify these priorities and focuses, mm -hmm. share community concerns, and then make sure the funding is there. Uh, and then staff have the ability to address these things in the most effective way possible, given our capacity. And, and if there is a capacity gap, and it sounds like actually that's what we're hearing, like maybe we need to, I don't know if there's a practical way to do it, but put a little more money in this year's budget. Uh, I don't know, but for me, that's sort of where us as a board should be tackling these things as opposed to giving mm -hmm. fairly specific staff direction. Mm -hmm. And so it like absolutely agree this is critical stuff. It's how can we most effectively support it? And, and I think this this upcoming meeting is right now probably actually the best opportunity, regardless of the capacity in some of these. Mm -hmm. And I know how difficult it was for staff to finally get the province to commit to mm -hmm. holding those sessions next week. And um, as a as an area director. I find probably more than half of the questions that come to me from constituents have absolutely nothing to do with Area B in my role. Um, and, 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 and so to know other resources is helpful, but it's not often satisfying people from when I say something like, well, that's a matter for interior health. You know, they're just, uh, so I, yeah. Director Richmond. Um, probably doesn't need this kind of motion, but maybe to give us a, Direction forward here, um, I, I would say maybe maybe I put forward a motion that says uh, asking staff to report back after the provincial town hall session um, with a summary of that of those sessions as well as some suggested um, options for further engagement with the community with the affected homeowners. So in other words, let's have this session. Let's see what happens. Let's give staff a chance to see what's coming out of the community and report back to this group and follow up. That's a... Yeah. Thank you, I let see Director Crompton. Yeah. And let's follow... Yeah, Director. after Crompton. Yeah. Yeah. Um, does this motion create, I guess, one of the wins of this meeting happening is it correctly places the responsible party, the province, mm -hmm. in the place of addressing what's going on. And I'm just wondering if there's expectation with this motion. To me, that meeting seems like it's like the most important thing for this whole process. And so does, for, does this motion give expectations that the SLO is going to accomplish other things, you know, apart from what the province is able to deliver. Um, from what I heard through Mark saying, what, what sounds like the focus of the provincial session, it sounds like that won't address all the, the concerns and, and some of the questions coming out of the community. That's why I want staff to give staff an opportunity to hear that session, to hear if the province says no, that's not us, that's your regional government. <clears throat> or, you know what I mean? If there's things that are deflective, things that are come up, if there's a, a number of unanswered questions through this session that staff and, and Director Dermer feel that the, the community still really needs access to, that gives staff the opportunity to come back and say, yeah, this is what we've heard. This is still outstanding. Or me, you know, and I do all well, they come back and go, Province nailed it. <laughs> it covered everything. Everybody's really happy, yeah. including Sal. Yeah. <laughs> that's a, um, that's an so response, but I feel it'll be if, somewhere in between. If the motion <laughs> is um, that staff report back to the board, mm -hmm. I would second that. Okay. Okay. So that motion is amended. I'm completely it's not amended. Confused. That was the original motion. That's the motion. <laughs> no amendment. No motion. Credit. And you have it seconded. Improved. Let's just call it improved. <laughs> um, now. Can I respond to. Yes. Director DeMare. 
Director Ettingale's comments. I, I somewhat agree with you, but there is another way that this could be brought forward to be put in the work plan, and that's the community asking for it and not a director. So let's take a look at that scenario. There is a committee for that working group for that 56 properties there and uh, through a society, the Bridge River Valley Community Association. They're a committee under them now. They could bring, make a request to the board to have that information session where I'm not part of it. Because that's another way to get it onto that work plan and, and make it a priority. I'm just making that comment because that is a different way of, of coming at it. It is, yep. Director Penfield? Well, and again, maybe we're I'm stepping into the conversations we'll have as part of governance excellence, but in my understanding, actually, that sort of request would come to staff, staff would share with us some of the priorities the, the people the committee would share with us and us as a board would decide, do we agree that's a priority? Are we gonna put the, the funding and the, the, the resourcing there and staff would go up accordingly uh, to the funding we've given and the priorities we've set through our strategic plan and so on, as opposed to a community group expecting the, or any board member expecting we directly dictate the work plan. I don't, in my mind, that's, not how um, an effective organization will will operate in the, in the long term, and I know, um, and I guess to the resolution, I, I support the the resolution. I, I would hope if something comes back and staff identifies gaps, the the question of the conversation would be staff saying, "Hey, with our current capacity, we're not able to meet the sort of needs or wants of the community. Uh, what do you want us to do here? If you don't give us more resources or a change in priority focus." we're going to stay where we are. If you would like us to figure out the best way to handle this, here's the sort of capacity funding and priority changes we would need. We would agree or not. And if we agreed, then staff would figure out the best way to implement that. And so the ask would be built for more funding, priority shift, and so on at that point. But again, for me, I'm, I'm hoping this next meeting will negate the need to do that. But I think you know, if it needs to be followed, that's in my mind how it should happen. Uh, again, okay. uh, Director Herford, I, I just I okay. I'm just trying to manage the meeting in, in the proper like way. And so what we should be doing now is just speaking to the motion. <laughs> I'll remind you, Director. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, I'm supportive of this direction, and I think um, uh, it's it's been clear that uh, there's um, uh, a need for more information for and a and a desire for more information uh, for the folks affected by by this and um, and I think um, I'm hoping that the outcome of the of the meeting will leave us with as much as perfection is always uh, you know something that we're you know good to strive for is is likely will outline um, what the gaps are in the uh, and and where the questions are and who owns those answers yeah and um and then we can talk about what how best to to uh, to get those answers to the people that need to hear those answers and to me uh, our earlier discussions around which mechanism to be used to achieve that was was challenging i'd like to understand what the problem is coming out of coming out of this like where what those gaps are mm -hmm. do we have the capacity to address them and how best to do and how best to do that if if uh if there's a bunch of pieces for for us as a board so i'm more comfortable with this with this step and then um and uh i would also like to uh you know back to our strategic planning um piece there's the um director mac made some some comments around advocacy and the need for other orders of government i think that's those that's absolutely on point and lines straight up, directly up with our strategic um, uh, strategic plan and we've had examples of successes in that area through the work that staff's done ju just recently um, and these pieces are still moving so I'm I'm really uh, happy with the as much as things could be happening um, uh, faster I'm happy with the movement that we're seeing from the from the province uh, or that there is movement you know and that's not far enough and fast enough but but uh, I, I do think um, 
this next step uh, from them is a major win that is happening. And uh, hopefully we can capitalize on that as an organization and as that, um, uh, and the residents will, I was happy to hear CEO Paul talk about that, not necessarily the united front, but the folks being on the call at the virtual table that are responsible. So when it does get passed, it gets passed from this person to this person that's also on the call. So it's not just uh, a shuffle of concerns to whoever's not in the room um, or on the call. So I, I'm, I'm optimistic about that. I look forward to, um, to attending that call and, and uh, getting filling some gaps uh, I have myself. Thank you. Me too, yeah. Director Crompton. Uh, through the chair, did you intend to report back to us on this meeting at a future meeting? Like, do you need this with this resolution change? <laughs> <laughs> Which way do you do? Uh, through the chair, I think um, I'm hoping that this is answers a lot of the questions uh, that come from the community. Um, I don't know if I would have done that direct information report unless there was a request, but uh, I think I'm hoping that it's going to be a valuable exercise for the community and we will actually as a team get some learnings about how we communicate these things forward. Um, I, we, I know we have been providing information reports on general kind of updates related to our post wildfire recovery activities and, and this would likely have been one of the topics that were covered in the report of what we were doing. Thank, thank you. Uh, um, I'll support the the motion that I think the, the report coming back is is a good idea. I am a little nervous about sort of resolutions that direct yeah. staff's work at this level, but I think uh, this resolution is important enough to support. So I'll be in favor of it. Any other comments on the resolution? Then I'll call the question um, and ask for those in favor of the resolution to raise your hands. And that looks like unanimous to me. So if no one is opposed, that uh, resolution is passed. Thank you. So I'd like to make a comment. Okay. First of all, I want to thank Mark and his team. They've done an amazing job of number one, being able to get this town all on and number two for the riparian uh, changes for last year's wildfires in BC. So that is very, I know how much work it was, and I just want to compliment you one more time. Uh, this is, again, the very first major event where we lost structures in the SLRD. You know, we're, we're setting the template for moving forward, and we need to make sure, as our, our strategy plan says, that we're working for our communities and community members. And communication is number one. And I know we're, we're working on a communication program. It's definitely getting better. We get newsletters, we got uh, areas where people can make comments on and so on and so forth. But when it when it comes to um, a, a disaster like we've had up at up in the Brisbane Valley due to that wildfire, um, we need to make sure that we're working and and all the learnings that we're we're going through right now that they get implemented. And I know there's we just approved some funding. Uh, to try to secure some funding on the communication program for it. And I think this piece here that I'm just talking about is these virtual sessions where people can learn from each other are critical. And, and to your comment, Director Pennygill, yes, we need to put funding in to be able to do that. Because these those sessions are very important where people could actually talk to each other and move forward. Thank you. Next item, uh, also directed to me, our status of the Bray Lawrence Sewer Upgrade Project. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. Thank you, Director Phillips. And I see staff here for this. Um, 
Would you like to comment on this or retire? Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. No, the Baylor and Sewer Project has been going on for a long time and and uh, And it's not in it, and, and the, um, the project is not complete yet. Started in 2015 when the ministry um, said that you guys have to get it up to standards. And here we are now in 2014 and it's still not completed. And we need to, we need to finalize that project. And um, so I, I like, the staff to give an information report back to the board has been done in previous years so that we understand where we're at, including implications on financial impacts, considerations that need to be taken to get that project done. There was a proposal in the growing community fund for $400,000 to complete it. And, um, and unfortunately that wasn't, approved so the task is you know where are we going to get the extra funding if we need it and what are the tasks that still need to be done that were included in that four hundred thousand dollars so that's what this resolution is about so before any resolutions and maybe up director richmond just again if i can get a staff perspective on what that looks yeah. like is that information easy to bring together what does that look like thank you Good. sure uh, this is it's on our work plan to bring back an information report on this um <clears throat> i was hoping to know more about the community works fund so i could provide some uh funding options but we can bring it back earlier with uh information request thank you Works. Thank you. So, if it's already in the works, do we need a resolution on this, or is this in the work plan? We can move along. Um, I mean, yeah, it's, it's in work plan. I, I could bring it back. Uh, and, um, like I said, I was waiting to hear more about the funding, but um, I can provide the information without options for funding um, and, and give an update. Okay. So I'll, I'll, still, I'll still make this, this uh, I'll make that motion as presented. The motion is that staff bring an information update report to a future board meeting regarding the Gray Lawrence Sewer Upgrade Project. And this report is to include what has been completed in phase two and so far, and the attachments. Um, Daniel Paul? I'm I'm wondering if it could be that staff bring an information update report for a future board meeting regarding the Braylor and Sewer upgrade project. Yeah, yeah. The director's report informs the rest, the through line for staff. And wanting to understand that this report would come with less information than we planned, what plan? And we're okay with that. Are you okay with shortening that? So, I'm good with the first sentence. Yes, with the first sentence. And all right, I I'll, I'll amend that resolution. Yeah, well, that's um, amended and yeah, correct the wrong thing. So, I have this moved, I don't have it seconded. Thank you, Jesse Morton. Seconded. So, we'll speak to that motion as amended. Thank you, Jeff. I'll be opposing this. I just don't think this is the right way to use um, board uh, resolutions. I think we, you know, work plans set out, team sits down, thinks through when the best time to present something like this to the board is, works with the board chair through agenda and uh, setting. And I heard Mr. Butt say that he'd like to wait until he has all the information to present this. And I think requiring a report before staff have the information that they would like, um, is it something that I'm supportive of? Kind of similar to that. I'm trying to, you know, these all these items, I'm trying to be understanding and empathetic that these are important issues for this area and for the director. So 
you know, we want to be able to bring stuff forward, but we talk all the time about how that process looks and what order things come to us and what staff work on today and tomorrow and the next day. So hearing that it's in the work plan, hearing that there's funding options that could come a little bit later, I, you know, from, I'm personally willing to wait for this report for staff, when staff is ready to present it to us. Um, so I do have a similar hesitancy as Director Crompton in that if we start throwing these motions out going, okay, well, I want to see this and, you know, report on this, that, or the other, some of them are coming, some of them aren't, they're in a timeline that's been explored by staff. I just feel that we're going to, we're going to really sort of confuse the, the staff work plans by doing too many of these types of resolutions. I would be more comfortable, Director Rares, I would be more comfortable recognizing that it's coming and funding options will be attached to it when it's ready. I would be more comfortable waiting until staff is ready to just present it on their normal work. Dr. Herford. Yeah, thank you. Um, when I saw this item, I was wondering, um, you know, where the project, so we had a quick, this quick update that gets coming and there's, there's this really big piece, which is the funding piece that we're waiting to have more information on. That's great. I wasn't sure if this was sitting in the bottom of the fuel list somewhere. And like, so that was, that is helpful. And the fact that it's on a work plan, I, I don't, I don't want to diminish the importance of that. Like, I think that's remarkable because there's all sorts of things that just aren't, that were a priority of the board at some other, some previous time. Um, so I, I'm, I'm inclined to let let that process um, continue. It's been a long, I, I understand it's been a, there was some lots of learning in this in preparation for this discussion with and, and thank you for, to uh, Director DeMera for the background on this. I think it's, um, it wasn't a project that I had um, uh, extensive uh, um, exposure to. So I found that beneficial. Um, and um, my, so I'm inclined to not support this, but when I think about, you know, reading minutes and going through and, and seeing a defeated motion like this, to me, defeating this motion, I don't want that to be seen as deprioritizing mm -hmm. the, this work by not supporting this motion. So I, I, in my comments, I get it, I'm going to say that I think that, uh, mm -hmm. you know, if I was just to go off reading minutes and to help uh, prioritize my work as, as staff, which is often the case, a vote against a defeated motion of this nature generally is a deprioritizing of something, but I don't think that's what's happening here. But I think that um, um, rescinding and not making that happen would be procedurally better for, for my mind. But I, 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 don't, I don't think it's supportable at this point, but that's my only caution. But I think we have good understanding in the room, but procedurally. Director Hartful and Director Pettingill. So I think, <clears throat> I feel like we have um, all the information except for the financial piece of it. And, and I'm just wondering if we could support this motion when all the information is, is available for staff to bring back to the board. Is that? That's what was going to happen anyways. Right, exactly. So I think, can we not support it? By, but we're missing the financial piece of it because we're not sure about grants or whatever, right? And we were waiting for that. You were you were waiting for that? All right, so can we just wait for that and then bring it all back? And, and that's what the original piece was. But I mean, if we could support that motion to include that when that happens, <laughs> information back to the board. Just a comment. Um, as you stated, uh, Director Herford, that background information was critical because we've got so many new directors on, on the board that don't realize how long this has been taking. And every year that passes, the costs go up and up and up and up. As we witnessed with the wastewater treatment plant in North Vancouver. And so and that's kind of the urgency to, to keep moving forward. All I've done is the motion is now it's just the first sentence that staff bring back an information report to a future board meeting regarding a trailer and sewer upgrade project. Right. So it's at an upcoming board meeting. It's, it's not, does it has to be done right away. Right. 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 Right.
Okay, Director Pittingham. Yeah, I mean, with that understanding, it's a little easier to support this. I'm a bit hesitant because uh, it sounds like that's exactly what's already happening. So the motion seems redundant. Um, and I guess the thing I wanted to flag for me is you know, we did have the discussion yesterday about our governance and the work related to the governance plan and sort of talked about in the procedures bylaw. We're going to dig into, I think, to my mind, how we as a board effectively resolve some of these things. Because I think implicit in the ask for this resolution is a director saying there's something in terms of priority that I think we're missing as a group. And I'd like to have a discussion about that and move that forward in a positive way. And I think we're not on the same page about how we can effectively do that as a group. And, and so I just sort of want to flag that for that thing we talked about yesterday. We need to make sure where we're having that discussion to make sure that we can, uh, you know, which one, regardless of which one of us has this sort of concern that we can bring it forward in a way that, you know, have a discussion we need to have. And for me though, I think, I'm so sorry. Where I am and I'm, I just feel that staff is doing the work. Um, and, and yeah, I just don't want to sort of add extra resolutions that for me don't add clarity because it, it's already being done. And Director French, and I apologize for that phone call. Thank you, Chair. Um, I won't be supporting the motion and it's purely from a, a good governance and process point of view. Uh, I, I see this as work that is already planned. And I also see this as a governing body directing work for staff. Why do we have a chief administrative officer if we at this table are, are directing the work? And I'm with um, Director Herford in, in his thought of maybe the most appropriate thing to do here is to rescind the motion because of the optics of um, folks in three minutes and potentially seeing this board voting down this motion, not because we don't support the work to be done, but purely because um, we feel that this is not the way for this board to, to govern. Thank you. Are there any more comments? Thank you, Director Pittingham. Thank you, would you like me to call the question on the vote? Yes, okay. Um, all those in favor of the motion? Could you, so the motion is just the uh, first, staff, first sentence? Yep. Staff bring an information update report to a future board meeting regarding the Gray Lawrence sewer upgrade project. Yeah. <laughs> <Same. laughs> So if that's if that's a question, given where we are now, we've had a bunch of comments, but if we say vote it down for process reasons, but we're expecting this to come, if we vote it down to the old Kevin. Yeah, that was my question. <laughs> <laughs> if we don't, yeah, it's simply and, meant to come back. If we put a motion saying, you know, basically saying the opposite, we all want it to come back. We all agreed it should come back. Some of us just feel that it should be on, on staff's work plan as they see fit. So, they, I have an idea. I'm glad you do, Jack. <laughs> I'll move an amendment that says at on on on, on staff's uh, intended timeline. <laughs> what was that? On staff's intended timeline. Yeah. I'll speak to them. I'll, I'll, can I speak to me? Uh, speaking to the amendment, yeah. You know, I'll, I'll support the amendment just to get this over the line here because yeah. I think we're all on the same page here. Yes. But I think you know what we're what we're talking about here is the fact that if every week and this is not a slight in any way, you guys are everybody's trying to do their job and represent the residents. But if a director brings three, four of these reports every single month, we're going to turn turn the work plan upside down. We need to have confidence in our staff that they prioritize what they've heard from us in the way they've heard from us. So. You know, I get the intent, especially being more so personally with the wildfire situation or recovery situation. I get the intention of all these reports. I just want to caution us that this is the discussion that results in these motions. I think maybe a good place to start is 
a question to staff, hey, are we going to see a report on this? And if so, when? If that's not acceptable, then we have a conversation as look at this has to be moved up and we all have that conversation as to why it needs to be moved up in the timeline. Uh, but I think that these conversations should start with a question that sounds like, is this item coming back to the board and when? And are we comfortable with that? Um, so I'll support the motion now just to get it going because I think we all want to see this come back. So and only only Director DeMere is speaking for the amendment. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, I'll agree to the amendment. All right, then we have to vote on the amendment. All in favor? The amendment is passed. So that staff bring an information update report to a future board meeting regarding the Bray Lawn sewer upgrade project. Uh, according to the staff timeline, mm -hmm. on the staff, staff timeline, yeah. is the resolution that we're voting on. Mm -hmm. All in favor? So I think I want to speak to. Oh, sorry. Self? No. Am I cutting you off? You're okay. I would like to speak to him. Oh, Jack. Mm -hmm. I, like um, I know I made the amendment. I'm going to vote against this. I, 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 every single meeting, Area A is bringing stuff to move their items ahead. And then, you know, Area C better bring theirs because yeah. if they don't, then the Area A stuff goes up the list. It's mm -hmm. like, what are we doing? This is not the way we should be doing things because um, it's, it's not about Area A getting a lead on Area C. It's about us moving together. And so I won't be supporting this motion. And then Director Julian. Well, I'll, I'll send my comment after the meeting. Okay. Call the question. All right. All in favor of the amended uh, resolution? We've got one, two, three, four, five, six. And also call on screen seven. So. I don't have to call for a pose. We know that's a majority. No, you still, no, you still, still call for a pose. Opposed? And the Richmond, Bedford, Crompton, and French, or against. So that resolution is passed. And. When these resolutions go to the chair for approval to be on the board, meeting. I'm wondering through our governance review whereby the, the chair working with the CEO have a look at it and resolutions like the ones that you're presenting, all three of these. And can work with staff to see if they've got it in their work plan. So that and then that could come back to the person that's making these resolutions, saying it's already in the work plan. Did you still want it to be on the agenda? Or did you want to modify it to be on the agenda? Food for thought. All right, and I'd like CAO Paul to have the opportunity to say a word here. Yeah, I, I just want to make, mention that during this, I did make a note under Governor's Excellence for us to discuss internally with staff how we support directors in their director report and a decision tree that would do that. It was it a notice of motion because then that forces that that's different. It, it needs to be on the agenda, it's forcing it. Right. And then is it already on the work plan? So those that decision tree, like how do we help directors through a decision tree? So I think this conversation feeds to that discussion about governance excellence because we're here to support the success of everyone at this table and the success of democracy. So, um, Dr. Crompton? You can also reach out to the chair and say, there's something I'd like to have on a future agenda and the chair can talk to the CAO as they do agenda setting. And I think that that's an, ex an acceptable way of doing things also. But uh, I'm concerned by the director's reports. I don't think that they're additive. Yeah, just in defense of Director Demera, I thought I'd heard in a previous meeting uh, some suggestion that this had been staff's ask about how to do this, and it sounds like there's maybe some confusion about how we do this best. And and I'm I've been assuming that 
in the procedures about the discussion that's exactly one of the things we're going to be talking about. So this is the way to do things. Oh yes. Sure. <laughs> it's part of the procedures by the review. Sorry, that we're intending to these directors' reports is how we want to do agenda setting. That's been some people's understanding. Oh, I see. Okay. So okay. Not that we should. Okay, I see. <laughs> I was like, all right. <laughs> Sorry. There's some other reading. And 9.4. <clears throat> yeah. 9.4. Which is a request from Director DeMare for a virtual information session for the Gold Ridge Water Service Commission Assessment and Asset Management Plan. Can I speak to it? Please do. Yeah. yeah. With our asset management program moving forward, and we, you know, we've identified a lot of areas that are going to need work. And um, the Goldbridge Water Service Condition Assessment and Assessment Management Plan was initiated by staff, and then they came to Director Area A for additional funding to do a really good uh, uh, plan. The plan is excellent. And uh, how do we communicate that to the community? So this is, you know, um, and I I did mention this prior to the wildfire, or actually it was during the wildfire. And uh, we got this report just about the time, just after the wildfire started. And you know, I did talk to Omar about the virtual information session on this on this plan at that time. And I, I know that it's been hectic with the EOC and Omar was involved in the EOC mm -hmm. and the department also. But uh, we need to figure out how we're going to get this information out to the public in a meaningful way. I've looked at that report quite a bit, and I've thought about funding the same company to have a report that they can that can be shared with the public, very similar to the um, the Braylorn Water Service. When I funded the study there to move one one water line from the back of the properties onto a main street because it was causing issues and it was the project that it wanted to do. And I funded um, a map that was easier to read and understand that was shared with the public. So when we move forward with our asset management plan, how are we gonna get the information to the public so they understand what their what their services look like and what needs to be done in the future. So that's what this, this directive report is about. And one way, as I've talked about previously, is virtual sessions so people can ask questions online. Any questions from the board or comments? So, and maybe this is something that an answer would have to come back to a future meeting. If the service area that covers this, uh, would it generally cover communications around this sort of topic? And so where I'm getting to is, is if this, if as a board, we thought this, the things the service area is covering wasn't communicating adequately, is this where we could ask for uh, or ask for more resources here with a comment that we would like to see patients improved and so on. And that's why we're wanting to put more resources there and, and you know, the have a discussion with the, the community about when they're, they're willing to fund that level of additional communication. And so, or is communication always through general government and there's a bit of a for the chair. <laughs> It's a really good question. I probably can't answer it te technically absolutely correctly, but I can say that project budgets 
could be could have communi uh, robot communication inserted into them, and we do have projects that communications managers that they code to they code their time to that project. Whether or not a service agreement or service area would cover that is a question that I'm getting a nod of yes. It does. And so I guess that, like again, for me, this is very specific of directing staff work sort of outside of strategic planning we've done and so on, outside of the budget. And so for me, the the sort of important ask here is, is more communication, especially on this topic. And as I understood the budget we did, this is where the area director would be able to sort of ask for that when they're doing the budgeting and, and say, hey, I want more budget here for this reason. You can contemplate that as a board. Um, and so I think also there's a, a piece in the governance excellence about making sure we all understand that's the process we go through. We agree that is the process to do it. And so I guess that's how I would prefer to be able to tackle this kind of thing. Through the chair. Um, I would, similar to the prior motion, the detail of this moves from strategic to tactical. Um, how we do. Uh, there is an asset management project underway that is on the work plan. And this, like our assets, all our the assets are all part of part of that, so it would be reported on. My my concern would be, so then another area director could say, I want my asset management report as well on this asset a bit sooner than the overall report. So for me, what I'm hearing from this from is we have we have some really good strategies for governance excellence. We have some really good pathways forward. Um, through these discussions that we know we need to dig into and that the needs of the communities and i don't know if all communities some might be more digital digitally social media scroll click and scroll um, the needs of many communities of communities being voiced here are more investments into more frequent and more virtual live information sessions and that our overall management of our communications should consider that in the future. Dr. Pettyville, Dr. Herford. Yeah, and I think that's what I was trying to say in a clumsy way. I'm hearing overall a need for more communication. We need to get that into our budget and state that as a board at communication level, we support this, but we don't get into the details of how, but we do need to make sure the resources there and we do that through our budgets um, and at a very general level of strategic plan, but we don't, um, yeah, I don't think we should get into the level of how you communicate on specific projects. Um, but if communication is a concern, we need to make sure there's more resources for communication. Through the chair, I think if for the single staff model, I think a really good through line here is to say, you know, as, as fledgling as I am right now in my two months in, it's to provide direction on the how and do with staff. And if I'm not doing that right, or I'm not meeting the needs of this table, that's, that's addressed directly to me in my performance review. And um, clearly communicated as, as, as a path forward. Specific to this one, I don't know if the staff want to specifically talk to this or if the board wants to specifically talk about this subject, but I, I that's my overall perspective. Uh, I'll keep it to the overall perspective and then let's see if you want to hear. Yeah, I, I won't speak to the everybody here about it right now, but the I think that um the, this one sort of brought up that that service the big area challenge because when we think about our overall budgeting, which we just went through, and I know that we I was excited it was in a review here, but we bring it back here now. When I think about a resident in the in any electoral area and what actually ends up on that bill, it's different. It is so different from, from property to property, depending on which service area they, they fall in and so on. And I can see having specific questions with specific service areas. So you'd have a subset of the population that's really interested in 
something. And maybe they are seeing the, the um, you know, an undue financial burden or a, or a challenging situation with that service area. And I, and, um, and how we deal and how we deal with, with that, I think is, um, I've been trying to figure out how I, how I reconcile that in my mind, let alone like someone looking at their bill and having concerns with specific areas, which is generally when the concerns come, right? When it's built up other times, other areas. So um, through the discussions today, I've been thinking about, you know, how, what's an appropriate way uh, to feels like more, more communication or a different form of communication to the area, to the areas um uh say paul brought up the the uh what is what, what is feels like a bridge too far the monthly pieces that that some elected um area directors have with their you know in other in other um areas but maybe this is where something setting some goals about you know a standing you know once a once a year this, this happens and residents of each electoral area can come and do and do these things like having some set some set pieces to maybe get ahead of some of these things i get that we it feels like we're maybe in a bit of a deficit of that communication we're not communicating in the way in the way that uh um or maybe at the level that the folks are interested in and i i do agree with say paul that that's in this model that comes down to like making sure we define what those what that level is and task our CAO with achieving that. So, um, but again, being this prescriptive is I'm not comfortable with, but that area service area aspect of it really, I don't know what we, I don't know exactly what we do with that, but I do like the recommendation suggestion communicating on some of these service areas do require more, um, will require more communication incorporating that, that um, into the service itself, I guess. So, that's just general music. I don't think I have a, I can't think I can turn that into a question, unfortunately. But. Back to the man. And I just want to make a comment on, on particularly this one here, is that the Goldbridge water system, and then, and you see in the background to it, again, background, so you under, understand the situation with that. With that service uh, during the wildfire in both Braylord and Goldridge, people stayed behind and they actually put sprinklers are on, on all the buildings and tested each water system to see if it, the water system would handle and you may be pervy to that what they did but they tested the Brayla water system with all these sprinklers on, on the houses in it, and it worked. They tested it on the Goldbridge water system and it did not work. BC Wildfire came along and helped them out with pumps down on the Bridge River and facilitated being able to pump to have all the sprinkler systems work. They also had a two inch line open at each place to make sure that fire hoses could be used from the fire entrance. The individual people there did that, did that test. And, and, and that's the importance of this met asset management plan that it talks about that aspect of the, uh, like for fire situations, that system is not capable of handling it. I read the report in detail. And uh, that's why this one was important. Now, again, that goes back to what we talked about when resolutions like this go in. Um, maybe it is a discussion with the chair prior to, to see if it's on the work plan and where it's at on the work plan. But in my opinion, if we're going to be funding these um, condition assessment and asset asset management plans, which we need to do for all the various services in the electoral areas, somehow there's got to be a communication program that goes with it back to the public. If if this conversation only does that, 
to get it into into policies or the programs. I'm comfortable with that. As a resident of the being into service, I would like to know what the conditions are. So whatever the sewer or whatever, whatever they are. Thank you. Yeah, as area B, I would be appreciative of a bit more communication on some of our service area, Anderson Lake Park, for example, where um yeah, I can see I can see we could do better there. Yep. Director Compton, yes. This review of the fuel, I and, and and these this these communications updates. Do you have uh, uh, eyes on how you are intending to take those on over the next <laughs> months and years, or is that something that's still being? Um, considered like where this fits in that work chair it's a good question so there are things i'm not done in the format yet similar to what was discussed yesterday the district of squamish is doing saying you know, we're focusing on saving lives and then going down uh that would inform it so right now I'm seeing webs and I'm seeing through lines, how what the timelines of everything, this strategic, this, this strategic, mm -hmm. strategic, oh my gosh, the strategic directions are discussed today. And then the fuel review that April will really help me understand. Right now, there are things on the fuel that I don't know if the board is, is even wants to consider anymore. Mm -hmm. So once we get that taken away, put, oh, this thing's missing, how did that get missed? That's really going to help a lot. Mm -hmm. So asking for some patience and time on how to see the full picture, but I'm amazed about what I can see now compared to a month ago. Perhaps. Thanks. Thank you. Could I ask staff for an update? An update? The department of situation. Where where is it at? On the, yes, please. Uh, I'm sure. Um, so this this specific report is 162 pages and generally not something I think would be shared with the public. It's a report that would help us apply for grants um, and a report for staff to take that information and put that into our asset management plan. Um, the asset there is an asset management plan as part of this report, but that's not our asset management plan. That's a recommend a consultant's recommendation on. What we should do, um, whether it's feasible or not, is is up to us to decide. Um, I, so I, I think there are, we, we could provide information to the public um, in a very compressed manner of, of what the system is and, and kind of upgrades it needs. But um, I, I don't know the information session is necessarily the best tool for that. Thank you. Is, um, is it in your work plan? Just what you talked about. Uh, no, it, it, it wasn't to to provide a public update on on the uh, condition of the works. No, it wasn't. Yeah, it, was, it, it, it was brought up at the OCP public public meeting by one individual that. Um, that's paid sixteen hundred dollars for for the service that he couldn't even run a sprinkler during the waffler. And it's it's a concern for them, of course, because we're going back into another another uh, fire season. I'm not sure of all the rest of the water services that are within the electoral areas that they're capable of. People using be able to use the sprinklers to protect their households. <clears throat> but in this case, that's exactly what we're talking about. Through chair. And that, that's another big concern for us as infrastructure <clears throat> holders is the public using our infrastructure, not necessarily trained firefighters. Um, it's pretty easy to, to do some damage to our system. So that's a big concern for me 
and uh, maybe a discussion with our fire chief as well. Yep. Thank you. And Director Pennygill? Yeah, I just want to clarify. I think I, I thought I heard, though, that some higher level understanding of where this thing is will come back with the asset management planning work as I part of it. Yeah. So in that sense, it's in it's in the works. Is that yeah, that's what I'm trying to understand. It sounds like, you know, but it's not, not like, anything. yeah. Maybe not a specific piece on this specific topic, but in the asset management plan is going to cover cover a number of things such as this when that's ready. So, um, but, well, any any this this is part of our assets and yeah. it will be included with with any kind of uh, yeah updates. Um, the communication piece was not specified. Go ahead. Was a motion made? Thank no, you. No. Um, <clears throat> motion received. Motion to receive. Second, seconded by Director Hartzell. I'll call the question. All in favor? And opposed. Opposed Director the Mayor. And that's what we did that. So we received. Thank you. <clears throat> There's one more item on this agenda, 11.1. Like I'm sorry, Director Matt, yeah, yeah, did you uh, vote against that? Did just I have a question that? for my information. <laughs> so <clears throat> Sal doesn't have uh, money available, or we don't have money available for the uh, the sewer upgrade or whatever. Have we ever decided what we're doing specifically with the uh, provincial money that the regional district got for the four electoral areas? I know there was some a wish list that was thrown out by staff of what we were going to do with that money. Mm -hmm. But we never we never confirmed it or voted on it. So, well, uh, what did we get? One point six million or something? Or did we not have a discussion about that? Do you agree? I, I think you might have missed Lola. that meeting. No, no, we did it. We talked about it in the what? Yeah, we did. We, we there was like four items mm -hmm. in transit that were all mm -hmm. identified. There was a list provided by staff. Discussion that came back a second time to the board with a rev revised list. And it was yeah, it's been hard. Okay. Thank you, Sam. <clears throat> we are up to the Minister of Emergency Management and Climate Readiness, <clears throat> Bo and Ma, the letter to chairs, Emergency and Disaster Management Act. Welcome back. I don't have a, any specific presentation on uh, this item, <laughs> uh, but I would be happy to answer any questions. Oh my and, God. and also <laughs> answer any questions with the caveat that, <laughs> with the caveat that I have not uh, done been able to as much as I'd like. Um, but I'm also also happy to outline uh, our, our you know, proposal for the use of the uh, forty-eight thousand dollars that was uh, received. Uh, to support uh, the, the the Emergency Management Disaster uh, Act uh, Indigenous Engagement uh, Requirements. Thank you. I'm looking for questions from the directors. Saying you need a motion to receive. Yeah. <laughs> motion Second. to receive, seconded by Director Bench. Uh, if anyone opposed, seeing none, we'll see that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, decision on late business. We have, oh, well, we have in the revised agenda 13.1. We don't have to decide on that one. Books. We do, I know we do also have that. We have uh, 
13.1 correspondence for information that came in from Fortis, BC, about the discharge permit. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, yes, sorry, Angela. Yeah. Um, through the chair, um, I believe Director Demare had a late item that he wanted the board to consider. If he is wanting to add it to the agenda, it needs to be done as part of twelve. So it needs to be done as part of yeah. 12. Okay. Yeah. So so the Fortis letter came in and it's part of the amended late agenda, but now we're making a decision on adding thirteen point two. Director DeMare, would you like to 12? Just, just all we need is information on what he is wanting to bring forward. And then we would add it to the agenda if the board is in approval of that as item 13.2. Yeah. So we right. just need a highlight. What's your response from, uh, from U UBCN resolution regarding Crown Grant and Mineral Claims and, and uh, Service Rights Support? Surface Rights Board resolution that was presented at, at the 2020, 2023? 2023, UBCA. UBCA. I just want to speak to it, the response. Okay. Do you understand? It's good. good. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay so moved by Director DeMare, seconded by Director Hopkall. So this is just to add this as a late yeah. business item. Um, is there anyone opposed to that? Okay, seeing then that will be 13.2. Mm -hmm. And first we will look at correspondence for information from Fortis that we received and Director Pettingill. Yeah, just a motion to receive and I'll speak to it if seconded. Seconded by Director Richmond. And please go ahead and speak to it. Yeah, I think, uh, unfortunately, maybe the, the outcome here isn't a surprise. I would just note that one of the resolutions that Squamish has going forward to the Lower Man Local Government Association, and I'm working from my head at the end of a couple of long days, but basically for the province to look a little deeper at cumulative impacts and cumulative assessments of some of these things, which seems as a gap for me, but uh, so that, that advocacy work is, is ongoing. Absolutely. Okay, so we have a motion to receive. Um, and thank you for your comments. Did you want to say something? No? Okay. Um, anyone opposed to the motion? No? So over to you, Director DeMare. Thank you. I, unfortunately, I missed out on the round table yesterday, but uh, the SRD, I, I got it written up here. The SRD resolution at the 2023 UBCN convention regarding Crown Granted Mineral Claims mm -hmm and service rights holders has been responded to by the province. They have started the Mineral Tenure Act moderniza modernization process, and I and another Braylor resident participated in the first information session. This is a portion of what was on a UBCM Compass newsletter regarding the information sessions, and that's how I found out about it. And, uh, the province has initiated work up to modernize the Mineral Tenure Act. UBCM members have endorsed several resolutions seeking amendments to the MTA to address potential real conflicts between surface and surface subsurface rights holders. So that's very, very positive. Mm -hmm. And uh, of both myself and the uh, railroad resident that attended that session had input during that session. Mm -hmm. So it was really, really good. And uh, they're holding another one on April 4th. And anybody that has attended it can attend. There was over 150 people on that session. Excellent. Excellent. Mm -hmm. That just goes to our uh, advocacy piece. Mm -hmm. And thank you for supporting that. The motion I presented at the very beginning of the release. Is the question in the NFC director? So the session that's on April 4th, is that also on the rights of property owners as far yeah. as the mineral yeah. rights go? If they've taken that information that they got and they're going to present it. Excellent. Yeah. Okay, Director Herbie? No, I, uh, thank you for bringing this forward. I think it's, it's always worth um, 
celebrating when we get when advocacy starts to sort of take take hold and we start to see some action. Um, I just wondered, do we have the um, a response letter. Do we have something we can add to the to the record to sort of help get this this out? I appreciate a verbal update, but if there's a yeah. if there's anything that we can that we can also include, I I'd like to to read a little bit more on it or be pointed to the what happens is the SLRD. There's two two of the motions that were uh, that we sent in uh, were responded to. The other one was regarding the Ministry of Trans Transportation and Infrastructure. So the SLRD does get, it'll come to the board. Okay, this is this the letters from the PBCM will be sent to the SLRD, like it's done in previous years. Great. So it's already breaking good news. Thank you. Uh, now, let me proceed a verbal report. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So, yeah. So it's on the record. Excellent. Yep. Second by Director French. Not opposed, seeing none, that motion is carried to receive that. Thank you, Director DeMare. Um, director's notice of motion. Not <laughs> We're good. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Eh? <laughs> so I think it would be a very good time to uh, break for lunch, obviously, <laughs> and then this committee of the whole we oh. recess. When you all done, all we got left is our debrief, right? Yeah. Uh, oh, wait to hear from Angela. Sorry, thanks. And through the chair, um, we do have the recommendations from the Cal meeting in yes. relation to the strategic plan mm -hmm. that need to be moved oh. through the board, um, and then. Lunch is ready, um, and then there is the debrief. Um, we could do number 16, yeah, which yeah. is moving those recommendations from the calendar and, get that thing, yes, and then recess for lunch. We could also have our lunch and bring it in here and debrief. But uh, uh, have an opportunity. Oh, you will have an opportunity to change your minds. You know, but no, 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 <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, Angela, the recommendations from the committee of the whole. We have. Uh, okay. Yes, please. Do you want me to speak to them? Can we just. You can just move them right through and they'll be captured in the minutes. If anyone needs a reminder of what those motions are, I'm happy to read them out to the group. Yes, please. No. I'll second that. Okay. So those are just moved along. Yeah. And then we adjourn the committee of the whole. We need to carry yeah. oh, okay. We're in regular now. I need a lunch. Yeah, we're in regular now. And we're so close. Perfect. It's right there. Just call the question. 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 <laughs> <laughs> okay. Be okay with, we're going to turn the recording on again, just in order to obtain a motion to Go into closed. Mm -hmm. Did we terminate the other meeting and we're back to we terminated the cow because we had we terminated the cow. Did we terminate the cow? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Well, I think it was I there. Agree. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, mean, was there. I, get, I get confused when we have it. was there. Well, that, <laughs> so we we thought we were streaming. And the purpose of turning on the live stream is just to have a motion to go into closed, move by. Director Richmond, seconded by Director Crofton. Thank you.